चलिए वेलकम एवरी वन आई होप यूर ऑल डूइंग वेल आई एम विशाल एंड इन दिस पी एम पी कोर्स आई एल बी कवरिंग मॉडर्न इंडियन हिस्ट्री बिफोर वी बाइट इन टू दी मीट ऑफ द मैटर लेट मी जस्ट गिव यू अ ब्रीफ ओवर व्यू ऑफ द वेरियस सेक्शन दैट वी आर गोइंग टू कवर नाउ फर्स्ट वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द एडवेंट ऑफ यूरोपियंस वेर एन वील बी एड्रेसिंग सर्टन फंडामेंटल क्वेश्चन रिगार्डिंग दिस थीम नेमली who came when did they arrive where did they first make landfall where did they establish their first factories and why did they come to indian shores secondly among the european powers in the modern period who were the first to arrive in india the portuguese right so we will be covering the portuguese experience in india their policies their governors the wars that they fought their expansion their modus operandi and the impact that the portuguese had on indian history thirdly with the arrival of later powers during the 16th and 17th century a conflict started emerging for mastery over the indian ocean resulting in a triangular conflict during the 17th century this resulted in the ousting of the portuguese and the rise of british dominance among the european powers and finally we will be addressing the factors responsible for the portuguese defeat right following this the next thing that we'll be covering is a glimpse of 18th century india wherein two processes were going on simultaneously one was the decline of the mughal empire and the other was the rise of regional powers so we'll be addressing the factors regarding the decline of the mughal empire and we'll conduct a brief overview brief survey of the rise of regional kingdoms Who, what were these powers? What was their nature? Who were their founders? Where were their capitals, etc.? ये सब डिस्कस करेंगे. Then we begin with the early, or we can say the advent of British rule, or the early. british conquest before we discuss the early british conquest a brief background a brief history of the east india company that will be covering along with the 
structure and basic functioning of the company and its factories in India. And secondly, we will be taking a look at the two earliest phases of British rule in India, expansion of British rule in India, namely the Anglo French wars, also known as the Carnatic wars in the middle of the 18th century, and secondly, the Anglo Bengal War constituted of two important battles the Battle of Plassey and Buxar. With these two wars, the British emerged not only as the most dominant European power in India, but also a contender for building an all India empire. Right? So, we are going to look at its impact or significance as well. Further, the aftermath of this uh, British conquest was very interesting, resulting in the establishment of the arrangement known as the dual government of Bengal following the Battle of Buxar and its undoing by Warren Hastings following the Regulating Act. of 1773. Right? We are going to look at the circumstances, provisions and its impact. After this, the next theme that we will be covering is the history of Governor Generals. But we are not going to cover all the governor generals, we are going to cover governor generals only from let us say 1773 up to 1857. Through the history of governor generals, we are going to cover the consolidation and expansion. of the British Indian Empire, that means the political expansion, empire building, the different wars, conquests, treaties, etcetera that took place. Secondly, we are going to take a look at their various reforms. in the fields of administration, revenue, society, law and justice, education, the press, and the evolving colonial policy with regards to Indian culture. Okay. Ye sab cover karenge. Who are the different governor generals that we will be covering? Warren Hastings, Cornwallis, John Shore,
Wellesley, George Barlow, Minto, Lord Hastings, Amherst, William Bentinck, Charles Metcalf, Auckland, Ellenborough, William Bentinck. Of course, began his career in India as Governor General of Bengal, but then with the regulating, sorry, uh, the Charter Act of 1833, he was designated as the Governor General of India. After Ellen Barrow, Ardinge, followed by Dalhousie, and finally Canning. Scanning through the Act for Better Government of India in 1858 was named Governor General of India and Viceroy. Right. So, ye sab hum through the history of Governor Generals cover karenge. These are the various themes that we will be covering. Following this. The next theme that we will be covering is anti colonial uprisings. Within which we will be covering the localized uprisings, which may be classified into tribal uprisings. Peasant revolts politico religious uprisings and finally rebellions by the Dispossessed landlords and chiefs. 
while discussing these uprisings, we will be looking out for the factors which were responsible, the leaders of these revolts and the regions that they affected, the British response to these uprisings and the aftermath. Okay? So, these are the things we will be covering through these anti-colonial uprisings. Then, we are going to come to the great revolt of 1857. Here, questions come Causes of the revolt, the leaders and storm centers of the revolt, causes for the failure of the revolt and consequences or significance of the revolt, right. Now, till this period, if we look at the broader picture of modern Indian history, modernization was something that was being done to us, okay. That means, the Europeans who had al already undergone the process of modernization were bringing this modernization to us. Now, from this period onwards, the uh, very uh, perspective of our analysis is going to shift. Now, Indians are going to be seen in the leadership position when it came to the modernizing project. And hence, from here, we shift gears to come into the Indian response to British conquest, right. Beginning with the 19th century, Socio religious reform movements, which laid the groundwork for the emergence of Indian nationalism. Right? Nationalism is a political project, but it also has a cultural and social roots. Those roots were laid by these reform movements. We are going to cover these. To the four eyes. Kya hai four eyes? The issues that the social religious reformers were trying to address, the ideas that drove them, the individuals involved, and institutions that they established. And finally, their impact. Okay. This uh, model ke through, we are going to cover the social religious reform movements. Then we come to the early portion of the Indian national movement. Nationalism before Gandhi. This is going to be our next main theme, wherein we are going to address the meaning and rise of Indian nationalism, what was it, where did it first emerge, who were in the driving seat, etc. Ye sab address karenge. Then the two early or three early phases of Indian nationalism we are going to address. The moderate phase of nationalism, the extremist phase of nationalism and the early round of revolutionary politics 
इसको एड्रेस करेंगे हम दिस इज गोइंग टू कवर the entire history of national movement from the formation of the congress right up to the beginning of the first world war theek hai then after this we are going to cover the national movement during the first world war within which we will be addressing things such as the arrival of mahatma gandhi now gandhi's political career may be divided into two innings first in south africa the second in india we'll be addressing gandhi and thought and the gandhi and strategy of practical politics that is his idea of satyagraha ये एड्रेस करना है हमें देन वी ऑल्सो नीड टू टॉक अबाउट दी अर्ली गांधी एंड मूवमेंट्स नेमली दिस की सत्याग्रह एट चंपारण अहमदाबाद खेड़ा चंपारण खेड़ा एंड अहमदाबाद देन वी ऑल्सो नीड टू कवर सम अदर डेवलपमेंट सच एज दी लखनऊ पैक्ट between the congress and muslim league the home rule movement and the august declaration this is going to set the stage for the next phase of the nationalist struggle which we can call the national movement post world war 1 this may be subdivided into smaller themes such as the rise of post war discontent due to things such as the rowlet act the rowlet satyagraha the jallianwala bag massacre the report of the hunter inquiry commission and the introduction of diarchy through the government of india act 1919 which is going to result in a major development known as the khilafat non cooperation movement right so we are going to look at the strategies adopted by the congress and mahatma gandhi we are also going to look at the impact that it had and then the slowing down of nationalist activity post the non cooperation movement due to 
the Varajist controversy and its subsequent revival due to the anti Simon agitation. As a result of which the national movement once again started going into its active phase and the build up towards the civil disobedience movement started to take place. यहां पर क्या क्या थीम्स कवर करेंगे हम थिंग्स सच एज दी नेहरू रिपोर्ट एंड जिन्नास 14 पॉइंट प्रोग्राम फॉलोड बाय दी पूर्ण स्वराज रेजोल्यूशन फॉलोड बाय दी लॉन्चिंग ऑफ दी civil disobedience movement before its suspension leading to the gandhi arvin pact the next major development coming in the form of the macdonald award which created a major controversy which was finally resolved with the Pune Pact, and this entire process culminated with the Government of India Act, nineteen thirty-five. Following which, there was a strategic debate. within the congress there was also a major controversy between the congress and muslim league with regards to the provincial assembly elections in 1937 which gave rise to a major phase of communalism however the congress was successful in forming ministries in 8 out of the 11 provinces but congress congress rule could not last for the full term of 5 years but only for 28 months during which congress congress was able to give a glimpse of swaraj to the people but also met with certain friction right following this period the congress ministries resigned almost uh, unanimous sorry uh, resigned simultaneously bringing us into the final stretch towards freedom and partition that is going to be our last main theme here we are going to cover things such as the august offer individual satyagraha crips proposal the quit india movement the emergence of a constitutional deadlock between the congress and muslim league for which two attempts were made to resolve it namely in the form of the cr formula and the desai liaquat pact however since it could not be resolved and the british were anxious to transfer power to india they started made initiating attempts 
to bring about an understanding between these two parties resulting in pacts or uh, conferences such as the wavel plan however the situation was complicated by the emergence of a radical trend within the indian armed forces and this movement began with the ina struggle the radicalism kept on increasing throughout the winter of 1945 46 with several upsurges the british finding themselves in an increasingly hostile environment became even more anxious to transfer power smoothly resulting in the cabinet mission plan however its failure resulted in communal violence across the country and finally the mount batten plan was put forward to provide both independence to india as well as partition it okay so these are the things that we are going to cover clear hai overview samajh mein aaya hai koi doubts to nahi hai doubts hai to please let me know i'll slow down and tell you again abhi humne padhna shuru nahi kiya hai keval ek overview bataya hai so that uh, the map of our course is clear in your mind ki hame kya kya cheeze cover karni hai right now coming to the very first theme kya tha the advent of Europeans. Now, if you turn to your notes, तो सबसे पहले एक table मिलेगा जहां पर कुछ fundamental questions have been addressed. Which Europeans came to India in the chronological order? When did they arrive? Dates are mentioned. Where did they first make landfall in India? Places are mentioned. And where did they establish their first factories? क्वेश्चंस यहां पे किस तरह के आएंगे यू मे बी आस्ट टू क्रोनोलॉजिकली अरेंज द यूरोपियंस इन ऑर्डर ऑफ देयर अराइवल तो क्या ऑर्डर है करेक्ट पोर्चुगीज डच ब्रिटिश डेन्स एंड द फ्रेंच फर्स्ट टू अराइव पोर्चुगीज लास्ट टू अराइव फ्रेंच फर्स्ट टू लीव फ्रेंच लास्ट टू लीव पोर्चुगीज when were the french forced to leave india carnatic wars mein 1740 se 1760 ke beech mein there were three wars known as the carnatic wars following which french influence ended in india the portuguese first arrived in india in 1498 and they continued to govern goa and its associated territories right up till 1961 when they were forcibly evicted so first to arrive were also the first to leave कौन आया था पोर्चुगीज में सबसे पहले इंडिया वास्को डगामा वेयर डिड ही फर्स्ट अराइव एट कालीकट राइट कहा है ये केरला में प्रेजेंट डे कोजी कोड को उस समय कालीकट बोलते थे पोर्चुगीज स्टैब्लिश देयर फर्स्ट फैक्ट्री एट कोचिन वंस अगेन इन दी मालाबार द डच अराइविंग इन 1596 केम टू सूरत स्टैब्लिशिंग देयर फर्स्ट फैक्ट्री एट मसूली अच्छा एक और तरह से क्वेश्चन आ सकता है इन विच पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया डेड दी पोर्चुगीज और दी फ्रेंच और दी डच इस्टेब्लिश देयर फर्स्ट फैक्ट्रीज यहां पे आपको ऑप्शंस दिए जाएंगे दी कोंकन कोस्ट मालाबार कोस्ट नॉर्दर्न सर्कास और दी कॉर्मैंडल कोस्ट सो व्हेन इट इज फॉर दी पोर्चुगीज क्या आंसर होगा मालाबार कोस्ट डच के लिए दी कॉर्मैंडल कोस्ट राइट तो आंध्र प्रदेश में है प्रेजेंट डे आंध्र प्रदेश में मसूली पटनम सो देयर मे बी अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ हिस्ट्री एंड जियोग्राफी आल्सो सो कीप दैट इन माइंड द ब्रिटिश फर्स्ट अराइव्ड इन इंडिया इन 1608 एट सूरत इस्टेब्लिशिंग देयर फर्स्ट फैक्ट्री एट मसूली पटनम इन 1611 देयर इज अ सर्टेन डाउट रिगार्डिंग दिस अमंग मोस्ट स्टूडेंट्स कहीं पे सूरत लिखा होता है कहीं पे मसूली पटनम वहां पर अगर आप ज्यादा ध्यान से पढ़ोगे ना यूल फाइंड दैट इफ द क्वेश्चन इज 
the first factory that the British established in India, uh, sorry, in Mughal Empire, that the answer is Surat. But India as a whole, that is Masuli Patnam. The Danish arrived in 1618 at Surat and established their first factory at Rankebar, once again on the Tamil coast. And the French arriving in 1667 at Surat established their first factory at Surat the next year in 1668. So, Bina Dekhe Batao, correct order kya hai? Portuguese, Dutch, British, Danes, and French. First British factory in India. Masuli Patnam, first British factory in the Mughal Empire, Surat, first British, first Portuguese factory in India, first British factory, oh, sorry, Portuguese factory, Cochin, where did the Portuguese arrive in India first? At Calicut, all the other powers, what was their location of arrival? Surat, Baki sab Surat mein aaya hua hai, thik hai? So, is tarah se aap log bar bar revise karoge, to yaad ho jayega, I am sure. Next. What were the factors for the arrival of Europeans to Indian shores? When did the Europeans first start arriving? Late 15th and early 16th century. By this point of time, Europe had already undergone radical upheaval and change kis tarah ka change experience kiya tha europe ne what was the kind of change you experienced by europe by this point of time first of all they had experienced the renaissance Secondly, following the renaissance and the commercial revolution which accompanied it, Europe had also seen the decline of feudalism and the rise of stable monarchies. And an additional fire had been lit among Europeans to explore and conquer due to a major crisis which had emerged with the fall of Constantinople. Okay? Now, this is what we have to do. What were the factors. Isme kaun sa factor nahi hai? Was the growing instability, political instability in India one of the factors which drove Europeans towards India or not? Nahi tha, kyunki Europeans ko us samay India ke baare mein kuch pata hai nahi tha. They were not concerned with whether India had a strong centralized empire or a fragmented polity at that point of time. There is no question of Europeans being attracted towards Indian shores due to growing instability. Okay? Wo factor nahi hoga yaha par. Now, what was the renaissance? The word renaissance is French, which means rebirth or reawakening. That means for something to reawaken, it must be asleep and for something to be reborn, it must be dead or dormant. So, what was that thing which was dead, dormant or sleeping, which was reawoken among Europeans from the 14th century onwards? Kya tha ye? Europe's 
इंटेलेक्चुअल क्यूरियोसिटी एंड कॉन्शियसनेस तो इफ यू हैड टू नीटली क्लासिफाई द रेनेसा इन टू वन ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कैटेगरीज विच वुड बी द मोस्ट एप्ट it was an economic movement it was a scientific movement it was a cultural movement or was it an intellectual movement it was an intellectual movement right now european history has traditionally been divided into three phases jaise indian history ko teen phases mein divide karte hain european history ko bhi teen phases mein first is the classical age second the middle ages and third is the modern age for the purpose of context classical age from roughly the 6th century bce Up to roughly the sixth century C. Middle Ages from the seventh to the fourteenth century C. And the modern age from the fourteenth century C onwards. now why is the most ancient period referred to as the classical age because it coincided with the great scientific cultural literary philosophical and technological advancements associated with the greek and roman civilization foundations for the european way of life were set during the classical age the middle ages began with the fall of the western roman empire when the western roman empire disintegrated during the 6th century it is regarded to be the beginning of the middle ages it is also known as the dark age of european history ab agar classical age ke against isko contrast karna hai to which features emerge kya characteristics emerge hote hain dark ages mein is it going to be a period where large empires exist and is it a period where intellectual freedom development growth in culture science knowledge all this takes place ya usko ulta hota hai इसका उल्टा होता है देर इज टैगनेंसी फ्रैगमेंटेशन इनवर्ड लुकिंग एटीट्यूड डेवलप इंसिलैरिटी बिकम्स दॉर्म पीपल आर टिमिड एंड सोशल इंस्टीट्यूशन आर डेलिबरेटली इन्वॉल्व इन कीपिंग दी पीपल इन अ परपेचुअल स्टेज ऑफ यूटिलेज इन अपेचुअल स्टेट ऑफ टिमिडिटी राइट सो इट इज अ पीरियड that is usually associated with socio economic stagnation the rise of feudalism constant warfare the domination of the church in the daily social and religious lives of the people the 
decline of knowledge rationality and the idea of humanism rather these values were replaced by the rise of deism and collectivism deism is a situation or it, it is a point of view which puts the interest of god and hence the church at the forefront of society that means that all exertions whether individual at the state level or at the social level they are going to be done in order to serve the interest of god collectivism is the opposite of individualism rather than putting the individual at the center of all progress the entire collective the entire society as a whole or the state system as a whole or the uh, institution of the state of the church as a whole that is going to be the focus of all development of all exertion theek hai now this changed during the modern age and the catalyst for change was something known as the renaissance this process is said to have started from the 14th century onwards beginning with italy and then spreading over western and central europe through the subsequent 15th and 16th centuries when europe was quote and quote reacquainted with its classical past theek hai so all the knowledge literature created by the greeks and romans that had been deliberately suppressed during the dark ages however by this point of time ye jo period hai na 7th to 14th century it may have been the dark age for europe but it was the golden age of islam arabs had emerged as the interlocutors of various cultures right they were in a constant conversation with all the cultures surrounding them and even beyond to chinese se bhi contact mein the indian se bhi persian se bhi egyptian se bhi and even the europeans they had used this period to gather the information the knowledge created by all these civilizations add their own genius to it and preserve it during the 14th century when italian merchants from genoa and venice came into increasing contact with the arabs they were the first to be reacquainted with the lost classical knowledge of greece and rome and with this a process of intellectual reawakening began theek hai lekin humne isko quote and quote mein kyon kiya hai kyunki ye purana idea hai the idea is that the credit for the modernization of europe should be given only to the classical europeans now from what we have understood with the process of cultural and intellectual exchange ya kya ye narrative accurate lagta hai nahi why because yes while the ancient roman and greek civilizations may have made a contribution towards the revival of the intellectual tradition of europe the other civilizations have been neglected by this narrative kyunki so, arabs ne to keval europeans nahi बाकी सबका भी इंटेलेक्चुअल क्रिएशन उन्होंने प्रिजर्व किया था ना तो दैट इज व्हाट यूरोप वाज रीअक्वेंटेड विद इन एनी केस रिजल्ट क्या था द रेनेसा और इंटेलेक्चुअल रीअवेकनिंग दिस इंटेलेक्चुअल रीअवेकनिंग इज गोइंग टू ट्रांसलेट इनटू अ ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ऑफ सोशल वैल्यूज नाउ द स्पिरिट ऑफ क्वेश्चनिंग और क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग is going to emerge as a major force kya hota hai ye suppose whatever i am telling you if you are accepting it as true without questioning then you are you applying your mind critically nahi 
when you start to question what you are hearing from any source of authority such as the state or the church right then you are engaging in critical thinking why is this important because it is the first step towards affecting change jab tak question nahi karoge tab tak koi alternative aap imagine nahi karoge that is the idea right so critical thinking was an outcome of the renaissance and with this many of the established social norms institutions and practices were questioned such as the church's domination of the society and life in general came under increasing attack secondly the church's monopoly over knowledge that also came under attack so new knowledge was created resulting in improvements in science and technology which resulted in better agricultural production increase in the supply of meat resulting in a higher population and improvements in the ship building and navigation technology further the techniques associated with craft production also began improving resulting in an increase in the volume of craft being produced and the number of people associated with these various craft productive activities manufacturing activities further because agricultural productivity had risen the labor intensity of agriculture had gone down freeing up a larger section of the population to undertake manufacturing jobs okay and the rise in craft production is going to re result in an increase in the supply of manufactured goods ab jahan pe supply hogi without demand is it possible no therefore it is going to bring about a commercial revolution the accumulated result of all these processes is going to be a rise in the general level of prosperity or a decline in the general level of prosperity a rise in the general level of prosperity right now india and europe had been in direct contact with each other during the ages of antiquity classical age mein. and while direct contact between india and europe had been lost during the middle ages ye completely disappear nahi hua tha with the rise of popularity the demand for eastern goods luxury goods especially is that going to rise or decline that is going to rise because people have more disposable income now so it affected a rise in the demand for oriental luxury right the renaissance also started a domino effect one of its early victims were feudalism what is feudalism it is a socio economic and political phenomena that is characterized by the decline of centralized authority political fragmentation constant warfare the emergence of uh, uh, regional locuses of power and 
they are always going to be involved in constant warfare amongst each other because uh, due to the political fragmentation trade and commerce has declined and agriculture has emerged as the most important economic activity so territorial warfare is going to become a very important phenomenon of feudalism now feudalism is going to decline because economic pressures are now against it kyunki ab ek commercial revolution ho raha hai people want what higher taxes or lower taxes on trade lower taxes and thus what are they going to support the idea of political unification or even greater political fragmentation unification right so with the decline of feudalism large and stable monarchical states emerge and each of these monarchical states had their own commercial arm with the merchants and traders these merchants and traders of different nations are now going to start competing against each other in the arena of international trade therefore it is now going to fall upon these large and stable monarchical governments to further facilitate the activities of their foreign traders and explorers okay so the decline of feudalism and the rise of large and stable monarchies also gave an impetus to foreign trade and exploration theek hai and third factor kya tha the fall of constantinople तो ये मैप है यूरोप एशिया अफ्रीका का ये दिस इज यूरोप फॉर दोज ऑफ यू जिनको नहीं समझ में आ रहा है गिव मी इतना अच्छा नहीं है मेरा ड्राइंग लेकिन आइडिया लग रहा है ना दिस इज यूरोप ये अफ्रीका एंड दिस इज एशिया विद दिस इंडिया अरेबियन पेनिनसुला एक्सेट्रा नाउ ड्यूरिंग द एंशियंट पीरियड India and Europe were connected through extensive networks of trade routes stretching both over land as well as over sea these were collectively known as the silk route or silk road theek hai to maritime iska arm bhi tha and overland arm bhi tha one of the important locations on this silk road was the modern city of istanbul back then it was known as constantinople constantinople rather than being an important crossroads of global trade was also a prominent political center acting for almost a thousand years as the capital of the eastern roman empire or the byzantine empire from the 13th century onwards byzantium or the byzantine empire whose territories stretched right from the balkan peninsula up to the uh, regions of egypt and northern persia up to the arabian peninsula that came under increasing attack from another political power which was forming at in this location and kon the ye the turks namely the usmania dynasty or the ottoman turks in 1453 the ottomans were finally successful in destroying the byzantine power and capturing constantinople 
what happened as a result not only constantinople but also the entire littoral region of the mediterranean of the levant came under the ottoman control therefore all the trade routes connecting india china and europe were now being controlled by the ottoman right the ottomans were looking to expand further into europe at the cost of the bulgarian and bosnian kingdoms they were also facing a lot of uh, competition from the western and central european powers the countries of egypt sorry of uh, portugal spain uh, the various uh, kingdoms of germany etc you know a grand alliance banaya hua tha against the ottomans right the pope was also interested in this why because the fall of constantinople was a, a major crisis for the christian world right islam was now knocking on the doors of europe and with the fall of constantinople the further expansion of islam in europe had become a palpable possibility ab usko kisi bhi kisi bhi keemat par rokna tha arrest karna tha right and uh, this is going to result in increasing hostilities between the western european and central european powers and uh, the ottomans on the one hand and secondly the european powers are going to become more and more concerned regarding the survival of christianity so when christianity was threatened in europe so what is the alternative export it to other regions of the world jahan pe abhi tak nahi pahunch paya hai right for that what is going to be required the discovery of new lands and people and thus the church as well as the state system of europe became directly involved in promoting explorations uh, and uh, adventures right so europe especially from the 15th century onwards underwent what is known either as the age of discovery or the age of adventure and the two earliest states to encourage this uh, process of discovery of adventure kon the hai portugal and spain okay and it is in this context that vasco da gama rounded the cape of good hope to arrive at calicut thus becoming the first european to do what to come to india to discover an all sea route to india theek okay? hai to ye ho gaya why clear humne sare wo questions answer kar diye hain what who when why where first factory etc haan ji and all sea route means a route between europe and india which did not have to pass an overland leg iske pehle bhi india aur europe ke beech mein there used to be sea trade during the indo roman period agar aapne ancient history padha hoga to us samay kya karte the वेस्टर्न कोस्ट से कई सारे शिप्स लेडन विद इंडियन गुड्स यूज टू ट्रैवल अप दी रेड सी एंड ये जो साइनाई पेनसुला वाला एरिया है ना इसको थ्रू कैरवैंस ओवर लैंड कवर करते थे एंड फ्रॉम इधर अलेक्जेंड्रिया और कायरो और एनी ऑफ दी अदर पोर्ट्स लोकेटेड ऑन दी नॉर्दर्न एज ऑफ दी साइनाई पेनसुला वहां से फिर फिर से दोबारा से टूवर्ड्स इटली और अदर यूरोपियन शोर्स दे यूज टू गो बट दिस वॉज नॉट एन ऑल सी रूट राइट बीच में इसमें छोटा सा एक लैंड वाला लेक भी था 
so the real significance of vasco da gama's achievement was that he was able to discover an all sea route between europe and india clear so ye to ho gaya the first portion factors for their arrival now next the portuguese in india firstly arrival and their early activities in 1497 vasco da gama started on his expedition from portugal under the patronage of king emmanuel of portugal in 1498 he reached calicut by sailing around the cape of good hope and was cordially received by the zamorin zamorin was the title of the local ruler of calicut theek hai who allowed him to trade in spices so vasco da gama arrived in india he was received by the zamorin who received certain gifts from vasco da gama us samay nazrana dete the gift exchange hote the and following this vasco da gama was given permission by the zamorin to trade in spices within his territory he returned to portugal with three ships full of pepper making a huge profit kitna profit tha 6000% 1 rupya lagaya to 60 rupaye wapas milega right and this made a big impact in europe kyun ab sabko kya laga ki ab to lottery lag gayi hai we just need to find a way to india and following vasco da gama's journey a number of other sailors are going to arrive in india as well the next was vasco da gama's friend pedro alvarez cabral he was also welcomed by the zamorin but what did he do when arrive when he arrived in india he said expel all the other merchants both indian as well as arab merchants and give me a monopoly on the overseas trade of calicut right is the zamorin going to ac- accept this nahi karega right so he tried to force the zamorin to expel the arab merchants from calicut and this brought him into conflict with the arabs right and what was the result cabral was forced to return empty handed theek hai the next development is in 1503 vasco da gama came back and uh, once again renegotiated a deal with the zamorin he was once able uh, once again able to persuade the zamorin to allow him to open a portuguese factory at cochin in 1503 which served as the early headquarters of the portuguese in india okay and despite the arab opposition the portuguese were able to establish their trading centers at calicut cochin and kananor and began harassing the arabs so using cochin as the base of their power they started to try and expel arabs from the entire malabar coast they began harassing the arabs the zamorin later attacked the portuguese in cochin but was defeated what was the end result by 1505 1506 the portuguese had emerged as the most dominant player in the malabar region theek okay? hai especially in uh, terms of naval warfare this established the uh, supremacy of the portuguese in the malabar theek okay? hai so these are the early developments that have taken place at cochin trading center matlab factory bol rahe ho na the first factory at cochin uh factory in the context of early modern indian history was a ha uh, warehouse come showroom theek okay? hai so it was not a place where goods were manufactured rather a place 
फ्रॉम वेयर गुड्स वर स्टोर्ड एंड अ प्लेस फ्रॉम वेयर दे वर ट्रेडेड ठीक है तो येस दी पोर्चुगीज डिड हैव अ प्रेजेंस एट कैलिकट बट दे वर नॉट अलाउड टू एस्टैब्लिश अ फोर्टिफाइड फैक्ट्री एट कैलिकट उनको फोर्टिफाइड फैक्ट्री बनाने की इजाजत सबसे पहले कोचिन uh, में दी गई ठीक है सो दैट वॉज देयर फर्स्ट फैक्ट्री ठीक है येस दे हैड अराइव इन कैलिकट दे हैड रिसीव परमिशन टू ट्रेड इन कैलिकट बट देर वर नो परमानेंट स्ट्रक्चर्स इरेक्टेड बाई देम इन कैलिकट अर्ली ऑन नेक्स्ट वी कम अक्रॉस अ टर्म एस्टाडो द इंडिया वॉट डज दिस मीन Estado means the establishment. Da is of, and India is India. So this was the establishment of India. It was a stand-in for the Portuguese state of India. Okay, it refers to the Portuguese state of India. So from the very beginning, the Portuguese had the ambition of not only establishing their monopoly over Indian trade. but also to establish their own trade their own governance and administrative machinery in india theek okay? hai it had four fold objectives kya objectives the inke first of all to establish a monopoly on the indian ocean trade by displacing the arabs before this it was the arabs who enjoyed a monopoly on indian ocean trade by displacing them the portuguese wanted to establish their monopoly secondly to launch a holy war against islam the portuguese were actually a medieval power who had started to modernize during this period so many of their medieval values namely their intense hostility towards other religions their zeal to spread christianity and their hostility especially against islam is evident in their early policy okay So the idea of holy war was actually being used to fulfill their economic and political objectives but it was made more palatable to the medieval portuguese mind by framing it within the context of a holy war against islam theek hai ha kya majority of population in portugal is islamic nahi नहीं है इट इज प्राइमरीली क्रिश्चियन पॉर्चुगल जो पूरा का पूरा आइबीरियन पेनसिला है ना दैट इज स्पेन एंड पॉर्चुगल कंबाइंड फॉर अबाउट थ्री हंड्रेड ईयर्स फ्रॉम द एट्थ टू देंथ सेंचुरी इट वॉज रूल्ड बाई द अरब्स तो वहाँ पे कई सारे कन्वर्जेंस हुए थे बट दे वर लेटर ड्रिवेन अवे फ्रॉम द आइबीरियन पेनसिला विद द राइज ऑफ द विजी गॉड एंड इबन बतूता मोरक्को से है मोरक्को से है ठीक है तो फिर जब विजी गॉड्स ने वापस रिकॉन्कर किया आइबीरियन पेनसुला को तो वंस अगेन ऑल दी मुस्लिम्स हु हैड कन्वर्टेड टू इस्लाम मेनी ऑफ देम रिकन्वर्टेड और जो नहीं हुए दे वर फोर्स टू गो अवे फ्रॉम देयर राइट देन फोर्टीन फिफ्टीन सेंचुरी में देर वॉज अ ग्रेट पर्जिंग ऑफ मुस्लिम्स इन द आइबीरियन पेनसुला ऑल्सो वहाँ पे कैथिक चर्च का इन्फ्लुंस बहुत ज़्यादा था so that is why most of the muslim population was decimated during that period and uh, it has not been able to recover since now the religious scenario is very different lekin jo composition hai that is primarily christian theek hai so pehla objective kya hai to create a monopoly second to launch a holy war against islam third to create a portuguese christian empire in the east and fourth to govern portuguese settlements in the east ठीक है तो दिस वॉज दी एस्टाडोडा इंडिया नॉट टू बी कंफ्यूज विद समथिंग लाइक दी पोर्चुगीज ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ठीक है तो इस तरह का भी क्वेश्चन आ सकता है कि वॉट वॉज दी एस्टाडोडा इंडिया नेक्स्ट वी कम अक्रॉस थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट पोर्चुगीज गवर्नर द फर्स्ट बींग फ्रांसिस्को डी आलमीडा टाइम पीरियड है फिफ्टीन जीरो फाइव टू 1509 he was the first governor of the portuguese in india and it was him who introduced the blue water policy with regards to the indian ocean 
what does this blue water policy call for it calls for the portuguese to be the dominant power at sea instead of becoming the dominant power at land so that it prioritizes naval superiority over landed power okay it also included the control of important choke points in the indian ocean so as part of this design the portuguese envisioned a scenario in which they are going to control all the choke points in the indian ocean all the points of ingress and egress jaise ki yahan pe aden ko control kar lo yahan pe hormuz ko control kar lo yahan pe goa ko control kar lo yahan pe colombo ko control kar lo yahan par control malacca over here sorry mombasa here mozambique here zanzibar this is the island of madagascar right so it was francisco de almeida who came up with the plan of establishing portuguese rule over all these important choke points right so by controlling this the portuguese would be able to govern who was allowed to enter the indian ocean who was allowed to leave the indian ocean by controlling all these important ports which were also important trading centers they would also be in a position to control control trade over the indian ocean theek okay? hai so ye idea kisne introduce kiya which portuguese governor general almeida ne theek okay? hai was he in a position to implement it in reality no that was done by his successor kon alfonso de albuquerque right now while in india this fellow uh, Almeida was involved in two important battles for control of the Indian Ocean. These were the battles of Dabul and Diu. The first battle, battle of Dabul, he lost, and the second he won. Who were the Portuguese fighting against? Against the combined powers of three states. Dabul be Gujarat coast of the Gujarat coast here. Okay. Both of these wars were fought against the combined forces of the Sultan of Gujarat, Sultan of Egypt, and the Zamorin of Calicut. Why? What was the reason for friction between the Portuguese and these powers? First of all, these were Islamic powers, and the Portuguese had launched a holy war against them. Second, they were all. the patrons of arab merchants whose monopoly the portuguese were seeking to end so this had brought these powers into conflict against the portuguese and thus they had made a common alliance clear hai kon kon si do battles hain dabul and diu first one lost by the portuguese second one they won sultanat of bijapur se bhi hua hai You are correct. Dabul was a port uh, of uh, Bijapur, Maharashtra. Me, a port hai. But uh, the interest of Bijapur, Golconda, uh, the Sultanate of uh, Egypt, the Sultanate of Gujarat, and the Zamorin, they were all interconnected over here because all of them were Muslim powers. All of them were also the clients, the patrons of the Arab merchants. so mainly teen important powers isme involved thi that is why we are naming these three powers aap naam lene ke liye bijapur aur golconda ko bhi isme add kar sakte ho second portuguese governor general alfonso de albuquerque he was the second governor of the portuguese in india 
and is considered to be the real founder of Portuguese power in the East. Yeah, yeah, the real founder of Portuguese power in the East. It was him who conquered all the strategic choke points in the Indian Ocean, such as Ormuz, Aden, Zanzibar, Malacca, etc. So, ye, jo, this particular map, hai na, this became a reality against Albuquerque and not Almeida. In 1510, Albuquerque also conquered Goa by defeating whom? The Adil Shahi rulers of Bijapur. For this purpose, he had entered into an alliance with Vijayanagar. Who was the ruler of Vijayanagar in 1510? Krishna Devraya. In support, uh, sorry, in exchange for Vijayanagar's neutrality, when uh, war broke out between uh, the Portuguese and uh, Bijapur, what was given to him by the Portuguese? The guarantee that war horses from Arabia and Khurasan are going to be exclusively supplied to the army of Vijayanagar. No horses are going to be given to Bijapur or Golconda, who were the biggest enemies of Vijayanagar at that point of time. What was the result? The decline of the Sultanate power and the rise of Vijayanagar power. Why? Because this was a time when superiority over land was measured in terms of the horse armies, the cavalry that the forces could command, could muster. Okay? So, this was under Albuquerque. And third Portuguese governor general, Nuno da Cunha. Time period is 1528 to 1538. Important development under him. Transfer of capital from Cochin to Goa. Okay. So, these are the important developments. Now, one aspect of the Portuguese history in India was the Cartas system. Kya tha ye Cartas? The word Kartas is the Portuguese adapt adaptation of the Arabic word Kirat, which means paper or document. The Kartas system was a system of passes or licenses, passes or permits issued by whom? issued by the Portuguese state, the Estadoda India, to whom the Arab and Indian merchants, for what? For plying trade upon the Indian Ocean. Since the Portuguese has established a monopoly on the Indian Ocean, they began to regulate who had access to the trade of the Indian Ocean as well, for which they started to issue passes or permits known as cartas. What was the basis for issuing these passes or permits? Paisa feko, tamasha dekho, right? So, the idea was that people had to pay for the privilege to trade along the Indian Ocean trade routes. And what is going to happen if somebody tries to conduct trade without obtaining proper passes? Their ships may be confiscated, their crew may be killed or imprisoned and their goods may be seized. Okay. So, in this way, the Portuguese, instead of getting directly involved in trade, had emerged as the constables of the Indian Ocean. They were more interested in policing the Indian Ocean. So, were they actually acting as enterprisers or were they acting as parasites? Parasites. This a negative result hoga later down the line. What is that? They were never able to develop their commercial arm. The East, they always remained a minor player when it came to commercial activities, right. They were also not able to derive the grand profits which other European powers were able to obtain. This resulted in a smaller war chest as compared to the other European powers. Because of these policies, did they have goodwill among the Indian traders and Indian rulers or were they looked at with suspicion always? With suspicion, right. So, they will not find any important allies later on. And abhi dekh raha hai the pattern 
why the portuguese were so easily displaced by the later europeans even though ha they had more than a centuries worth of lead clear so this is the kata system next we come to the issue of piracy another aspect of portuguese in india was their involvement in piracy what were they exploiting their naval superiority and kisko ye target kar rahe the not only traders that they were supposed to protect through this kata system but even muslim pilgrims who were going to saudi to in order to perform hajj right where was their base of piracy hogli hogli was their base of piracy clear thirdly their religious policy kis tarah ka religious policy pursue kar rahe the one of tolerance and openness or one of exclusivity and intolerance exclusivity and intolerance the portuguese adopted a bigoted religious policy one of their objectives was to launch a holy war against islam and establish a portuguese christian empire in india for doing this they wanted to aggressively spread christianity and what were the methods used by them first of all by encouraging mixed marriages between whom between portuguese sailors who were encouraged to settle in india and marry native women for this purpose alfonso de albuquerque also banned sati why doing so would allow the portuguese settlers to marry widows instead of them committing ritual suicide right the married settlers were known as casados e marcadores so this is another piece of trivia may be relevant for the exam i am not sure thus they tried to create a mixed indo portuguese christian community which possibly would remain loyal to the portuguese in the future so this was one strategy that they employed to encourage mixed marriages especially through the banning of sati second was the use of inducements especially in matters of public employment and land ownership so the portuguese governors made it so that only christians were allowed to hold hold public offices and secondly only christians were given the right to own land so if you want government office sarkari naukri chahiye to convert to christianity if you want your titles to be recognized by the government convert to christianity and last strategy used by them was that of forced conversion the portuguese used their political and military power to convert people forcibly uh, uh, by forbidding other forms of worship and even destroying hindu temples and islamic mosques okay so a bigoted religious policy was followed by them is this going to win them the goodwill of the people of india or is this going to win them the perpetual hostility of indians hostility of indians one more reason why the portuguese empire in india was not able to sustain next we come to the 17th century triangular conflict now the eastern portuguese empire may be described as a thasalocracy what is a thasalocracy a sea based power theek hai a power which sustains because of its naval superiority which has been established and is maintained because of its naval superiority that held sway over the indian ocean by controlling important choke points however in the 17th century uh, the 17th century witnessed a tripartite struggle for control over the maritime trade in india between which three parties the portuguese dutch and the british these were the earliest three powers to arrive in india na so in ke beech mein in the 17th century there is going to be a conflict important developments within this conflict kya kya hai number 1 in 1596 
the portuguese were forcibly expelled from southeast asia by the british to so, jo indonesia thailand uh, myanmar wala region hai wahan se british ne inko displace kar diya that was the first leg of portuguese decline in 1623 there was a major conflict in the southeast asia region between the dutch and the british there was a massacre in indonesia known as the amboyna massacre which resulted in the expulsion of the british from southeast asia so first the british replaced the portuguese in southeast asia and then they themselves were replaced by the dutch in southeast asia in 1632 the portuguese were expelled from hugli which they had been using as a base for piracy by whom by qasim khan he was the mughal governor of bengal during the reign of which mughal emperor shah jahan in 1662 ek major development hua kya shaadi hui kiske kiske beech mein the english prince and the portuguese princess the english prince charles ii married the portuguese princess catherine of braganza and uh, as a wedding gift he received the islands of bombay right as a wedding gift the next year all portuguese settlements on the malabar coast were captured by the dutch who built fort william at kochi theek okay? hai so portuguese authority by this point of time has not only been undermined in southeast asia but also on the eastern coast of bengal and also on the malabar coast and even in the konkan coast it is coming under attack there is also a growing alliance between the portuguese and british interest which is going to result in a major treaty in 1676 oh sorry in 1667 the city of bombay was leased by the british crown to the english east india company for an annual lease of 10 pounds simultaneously the east india company was also put in charge of managing all the portuguese settlements in india so this represented the end of polit uh, political initiative by the portuguese in india and their replacement by the british and by the 1690s the british and the dutch had also come to somewhat of an agreement the dutch who were more interested in the spice trade of the spice islands that is indonesia they agreed to withdraw their presence from india because british were more interested in india so they said that the indian ocean is large enough for both of us no need to keep on constantly fighting against you in the 1690s there was an agreement between the dutch who were more interested in indonesia and the british who were more interested in india to stay out of each other's territories thus at the end of this conflict the portuguese thread had been neutralized and the dutch influence was withdrawn the british became the most powerful european presence on indian shores at the end of this conflict clear now coming to the impact that the portuguese left on india the portuguese were the first european power to arrive in india and the last to leave 1498 to 1961 and they left an indelible mark on indian history and culture kis tarah ka mark choda inhone the advent of christianity in a major way the spread of christianity started in india with the arrival of the portuguese saint francis xavier led the evangelical mission to india saint francis xavier kaun the he was a jesuit catholic evangelist from portugal and his mission was in asia he wanted 
to spread Christianity in Asia. This included both the Portuguese controlled territories in India as well as areas which were not under Portuguese control in Southeast Asia and even China. That is India, China and Southeast Asia. He is famously buried where? Goa, the Basilica of Bomb Jesus. He is buried at Goa. His mummified remains can still be viewed lying in the sarcophagus at uh, this particular cathedral. But he did not die in Goa. He died while he was at sea, returning from a Christian mission in China. The Portuguese also made a major contribution towards the development of architecture. Kya introduce karenge? The Portuguese style of architecture, right? The Portuguese built many churches and forts on the western coast of India, including the churches and convents of Goa, which has been designated as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. The Goan culture was also massively influenced by the portuguese influence by the portuguese presence in terms of the cuisine attire customs festivals and folklore the portuguese also made a major contribution towards the development of indian agriculture they not their presence not only encouraged the cultivation of cash crops such as cotton which was in coming into increasing demand in the European market, but also they introduce a number of varieties of crops from South America. So, the Portuguese also had a large colony in Brazil and from there a number of crops were transplanted to India, such as new varieties of mango, papaya, pineapple, guava, chili peppers, shimla mirjis, kidney beans, rajma, potato, tomato, groundnuts, cashew nuts, tobacco and maize. Theke? So, these were the new crops or new crop varieties that they introduced in India. The Portuguese also brought the printing press to India. Why did they bring the printing press? What kind of literature did they want to publish? The Bible, right? So, the Portuguese introduced the printing press to India and printed copies of the Bible in Malayalam and Kannada, the local languages. The Portuguese also introduced for the first time the concept of armed trade in the Indian Ocean region. Before this, the concept of armed trade did not used to exist. And thus, they are going to set the template for the coming years, decades and centuries. All the European powers who are going to follow are they going to come unarmed or also with very serious armed contingents? Armed con contingents. So, merchants developed into merchant navies after this. Okay? The Portuguese introduced the concept of armed trade in the Indian Ocean and this was a precursor to conquest. They were also the first European power who introduced the notion of a European empire in Asia. Okay? Not only were the Portuguese the earliest to arrive in India, but they were also the first to have the vision of creating an overseas empire in India. Is this clear? So, these were their contributions or the impact that they had on Indian culture. Fort Williams, Kochi mein hai, British hai, right? Fort St. William, Calcutta mein hai. Now, 
one scheme which is not present in your notes is the factors behind the decline of Portuguese power in the Indian Ocean. Some of them we have already discussed such as Batao kya kya? Their predatory practices towards non Christians Indian rulers and traders leading in a leading to a deficit of trust and goodwill which also had a negative effect on Portuguese diplomacy. Okay. This is one factor why they were not able to sustain their early lead in the Indian Ocean region. Or kya factors responsible the? Or bataye. So, wo to humne baat kar li na. Non Christians, Indian rulers or traders, kisi ke saath bhi achhe relations maintain nahi kar paaye. Okay. Secondly, their rent seeking. Attitude with respect to trade resulting in underdevelopment of Portuguese. commerce due to which they had access to a smaller war chest as compared to their other European rivals. Thirdly, their excessive focus on establishing what kind of a power? Sea power or uh, land power? Sea power. This disrupted the balance that is necessary to establish an enduring empire. This balance is based upon both land as well as sea power. But they neglected land power development. or land power projection projection thus the foundation of portuguese power remained unstable especially given the quantum of their naval power against their future rivals as compared to the portuguese the british and danes had a, sorry the british and dutch had a larger more well equipped and a more modern navy next 
नेवल सुपीरियोरिटी ऑफ देयर यूरोपियन राइवल्स वॉट एल्स ठीक है तो देर वॉज नो रैशनल बेसिस फॉर इंपीरियल पॉलिसी इन दी एस्टाडोडा इंडिया and they became involved in irrational activities such as the propagation of christianity right as compared to the europe uh, other european powers they were interested only and only in trade initially speaking so this resulted in a loss of waste lot of wasted energy on the part of the portuguese they became involved in affairs which they had no business getting involved in usko aur thoda एक्सप्लोर करो लीडरशिप का प्रॉब्लम था तो क्यों था यस फेवरेटिज्म क्यों फेवरेटिज्म हाँ मोनार्किकल फ्यूडल पॉलिटी एग्जिस्टेड इन पोर्चुगल इन कंपैरिजन द डच एंड द ब्रिटिश पॉलिटीज वर मोर डेमोक्रेटिक ऑल दो दे वर नॉट कंप्लीटली डेमोक्रेटिक स्पेशली इन द बिगनिंग ऑफ द सेवेंटीन सेंचुरी बट दे वर रिलेटिवली मोर सो and they rewarded meritocracy as compared to the status birth uh, status of portuguese nobles theek hai ek minute ek ek karke ha so medieval feudal मोनार्किकल प्रिवलेजेस वर मोर डोमिनेंट अमंग दी पोर्चुगीज एज कंपेयर टू देयर अदर राइवल्स हाँ और क्या बोल रहे थे After the fall of Vijayanagar Empire, the Portuguese lost their importance. How? Okay. देखो तो horses की demand तो जो Deccani Sultanate थी वहाँ नहीं थी तो loss of one trading partner does not mean the collapse of trade ना and secondly the Portuguese themselves were never actually interested in uh, conducting this trade so they were not deriving actual profits out of it वो केवल एक fee collect कर रहे थे इस trade से so the decline of Vijayanagar may have taken away the maneuvering capability of the portuguese but did not have a direct impact on their decline theek hai to ye aap bol sakte ho secondly the alliance between vijayanagar and the portuguese was also a very uneasy one it was not a natural alliance so they were equally interested in spreading christianity even in the territories of vijayanagar although they were more hostile towards the deccani muslim sultanates but they were also quite hostile and quite eager to spread christianity इन दी तेलुगु और कन्नडा एंड तमिल स्पीकिंग रीजन ऑफ विजयनगर एम्पायर वर्ल्ड ठीक है तो वो जो आइडिया है दैट इज नॉट गोइंग टू बी वैलिड वन क्या क्या प्रायर टू हा तो देखो दी पोर्चुगीज एस्टाडोडा इंडिया functioned as a government department within the portuguese imperial system and thus it is going to suffer from all the problems 
दैट स्टेट एंटरप्राइजेज सफर फ्रॉम क्या होगा यहां पर वेस्टेज और इनफिशियंसी लेथार्जी बिकॉज फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द गवर्नमेंट अपॉइंटीज हैव द सेंस ऑफ एंटाइटलमेंट कि उनको कुछ प्रोएक्टिव नहीं करना है दे आर नॉट जज ऑन नेसेसरली ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ देयर अचीवमेंट्स इन अ रैशनल मैनर दे आर मोर यू कैन से कंप्लेसेंट एज कंपेयर टू प्राइवेट सेक्टर एम्प्लॉयज विद रिगार्ड्स टू देयर ड्यूटीज एंड द अचीवमेंट दैट दे हैव थर्डली दे ऑल्सो हैव लोअर डिस्क्रेशन क्योंकि एक नई कुर्सी ऑप्टेन करने के लिए भी पहले आपको लिस्बन खत लिखना पड़ेगा वहां से वापस रिप्लाई आएगा कि हाँ ठीक है बजट अप्रूव देन यू आर गोइंग टू बी एबल दैट चेयर और इक्विपमेंट मैं चेयर तो ऐसे आपको एग्जाम्पल दे रहा हूँ बट यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड द लेवल ऑफ डिस्क्रेशन एट द डिस्पोजल ऑफ पोर्चुगीज गवर्नर्स एंड ऑफिशियल तो लोअर discretionary and decision making powers and because of this their financial problems were मैग्निफाइड ठीक है तो वाइल दे वर देम सेल्स नेग्लेक्टफुल ऑफ देयर कमर्शियल एंटरप्राइज दिस कंपाउंडेड दैट प्रॉब्लम फर्दर सो इट रिजल्टेड इन लोअर प्रॉफिटेबिलिटी ठीक है एंड इसका रिजल्ट क्या था दैट इट वॉज having a smaller war chest as compared to the other european powers who came to india in the form of joint stock trading companies right and since they came as joint stock trading companies the british and dutch companies were able to mobilize the economic resources of the entire society of their countries whereas the portuguese presence in india was being supported only through पोर्चुगीज गवर्नमेंट बजेटरी सपोर्ट ठीक है तो इन कंपेरिजन द्रिटिश एंड डच जॉइंट स्टॉक ट्रेडिंग कंपनीज were able to raise large sums of money from the public directly secondly since these were joint stock trading companies their directors and officials were responsible only and only to their shareholders state interference was limited and thus the principle of meritocracy to a large extent operated within them thirdly because they were not wasting their energies in irrational pursuits their profitability and efficiency was also higher since the officials of the british and dutch trading companies did not have to suffer constant departmental oversight from london or amsterdam therefore their discretionary powers and agility decision making powers was greater and finally because of all these things they had access to a larger war chest theek okay? hai तो एक तो ये फैक्टर है एनीथिंग एल्स
तो वो वही बात है कि नेवल सुपीरियरिटी के ऊपर ज़्यादा फोकस कर रहे हैं और कुछ तो अंग्रेज भी कर रहे थे ब्रिटिश डच भी कर रहे थे How is that going to have an effect on the Portuguese uh, fortunes? Because देखो the Portuguese decline started from the 1530s itself. ठीक है ये period क्या था This was a period where the Mughal Empire was simply just coming into existence ठीक okay. it was only in the uh, second half of the 17th century that the moguls were able to actually find their feet oh, sorry uh, 16th century that they were able to find their feet and expand even during the reign of akbar the moguls were not in a position to project their power in any meaningful manner on the coastal areas of the deccan region so wahan pe portuguese ki affairs mein they were not in a position to directly interfere That is not a valid factor. Or any factor? Think about situation in Europe. Yes, sir. The Portuguese had a large empire during the 16th century. Their empire straddled two different oceans. Con con sir, the Atlantic Ocean as well as the Indian Ocean. in the minds of the portuguese administrator sitting in lisbon which was the more important position brazil or india brazil was more important so prioritization of brazil over india and this was compounded further because of an act that was known as the iberian union which represented the unification of the spanish and portuguese crowns under the spanish king or the portuguese king under the spanish king Philip the second was also the Holy Roman Emperor, right? So now Portugal simply was a, a minor principality of a large European empire, which had extensive possessions across the length and breadth of Latin America. So now, the Holy Roman Imperial calculations are, in that India's ka priority will be lower and lower. So India was neglected more and more this took place i think in 1580 ek bar confirm kar lena i am not entirely sure but i think as far as i can remember 1850 so, sorry 1580 theek hai and uh, finally whatever support the portuguese empire in india had been receiving from the Spanish that received a major blow due to the destruction of the Spanish Armada in 1588 at the hands of the British. Armada is the Spanish name for navy. Spanish navy was uh, thrashed by the British of the coast of Portugal, and so now, जो थोड़े बहुत ships the the Spanish were setting aside for service in India, even they had to be redirected for their more important positions at home and in Latin America. ठीक है? 
so this is the reason why the spanish lost their early lead in the indian conflict clear chalo good next a brief history of the english east india company it came into existence when the british queen elizabeth the first issued a charter to a group of merchants who belonged to two different companies who had agreed to merge together forming the east india company on the new years eve of 1600 Elizabeth the first issued a charter to this east newly established east india company to do what to trade exclusively with india right the charter was initially granted for a period of 15 years in all the territories east of the cape of good hope and all the territories west of the straits of magellan straits of magellan kahan par hai the southern tip of argentina उससे वेस्ट में कौन सा ओशन आएगा द पैसिफिक ओशन एंड ऑल द टेरिटरीज लाइंग टू द ईस्ट ऑफ द केप ऑफ गुड होप उसके ईस्ट में कौन सा ओशन आएगा इंडियन ओशन एंड पैसिफिक ओशन में एक्सक्लूसिवली इट वाज द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी व्हिच वाज गिवन द राइट टू ट्रेड ठीक है हाँ एक एक सेकेंड वॉट डू वी मीन बाई चोक पॉइंट चोक पॉइंट क्या होते हैं भाई बताओ स्ट्रेटेजिकली स्पीकिंग एनी जियोग्राफिकल फीचर और फॉर्मेशन विच मे बी ऑक्यूपाइड बाई एन आर्मी और नेवी इन ऑर्डर टू प्रिवेंट एन एनिमी फ्रॉम मेकिंग एन इंग्रेस इन टू दी स्ट्रेटेजिक रिजर्व रीजन ऑफ दी पावर डिपेंडिंग इट फॉर एग्जाम्पल अगर इंडिया में आना है तो नॉर्थ वेस्टर्न फ्रंटियर पर कुछ इंपॉर्टेंट माउंटेन पासेस हैं विच आर इजिली डिफेंसिबल सच एज दी हाइबर पास एक्सेट्रा इवन अ स्मॉल कंपनी ऑफ सोल्जर्स मे बी एबल टू डिफेंड इट अगेंस्ट अ वेरी लार्ज एनिमी राइट आप लोगों ने एक फिल्म देखी होगी 300 हंड्रेड फॉर एग्जाम्पल राइट उसमें दी हाँ दी गेट्स ऑफ थर्मोप्लाई दिखाए हुए हैं थ्री हंड्रेड स्पार्टन वर एबल टू होल्ड ऑफ अ लार्ज पर्जन आर्मी possibly consisting of more than a lakh soldiers for a period of more than 3 days theek hai to teen so ke against 1 lakh and they were able to defend it because of the natural features of that formation of the gates of thermopylae to ye hota hai choke point right ha sir aap kya bol rahe the फॉकलैंड आइलैंड्स हाँ फॉकलैंड एक्चुअली टेरा डेल फ्यूगा का जो सदर्न मोस्ट पोर्शन है ना उसके जस्ट नॉर्थ में तो इफ यू लुक एट द कोस्ट लाइन ऑफ साउथ अमेरिका तो इस तरह का आपको फॉर्मेशन दिखता है द टिप ऑफ आर्जेंटीना is punctuated by a narrow strait from an archipelago of very small islands which are scattered right above the southern sea known as the terra del fuego in dono ke beech mein in formations ke beech ka jo strait hai that is known as the straits of magellan दिस थिंग्स आर गोइंग टू बी कवर्ड इन योर जोग्राफी और प्लेसेज इन न्यूज एक्सेट्रा वहाँ पे कवर हो जाएगा आई एम श्योर कि कहीं ना कहीं और कवर हो जाएगा ठीक है बट दिस इज जस्ट फॉर रेफरेंस स्ट्रेट्स ऑफ मजेलन सदर्न टिप ऑफ साउथ अमेरिका में स्ट्रेट्स ऑफ मलाका सिंगापुर इंडोनेशिया के बीच वाला जो एरिया है उसको स्ट्रेट्स ऑफ मलाका बोलते हैं अब ये मत पूछना स्ट्रेट क्या होता है पता है ना क्या होता है इट इज़ अ नैरो बॉडी ऑफ वाटर सेपरेटिंग टू लार्जर लैंड मासेज 
right now coming back to this shuruaat hoti hai with this charter ab ye batao why was the queen so eager to facilitate the rise of the east india company kyun itni meherban ho rahi thi rani sahiba she himself uh, she herself was a major shareholder she had roughly 10% of the total stake in the east india company so she would have benefited from giving a monopoly to the east india company right acha at the time when the east india company received this charter who was the mogal monarch kab ye mila hai uh, charter 1600 mein who was the mogal emperor अकबर ठीक है तो एक और तरह से क्वेश्चन पूछा जा सकता है विच इंग्लिश मोनार्क वॉज द कंटेम्प्रेरी ऑफ अकबर एलिजाबेथ दी फर्स्ट राइट नाउ नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट डेवलपमेंट इज गोइंग टू टेक प्लेस इन 1600 although the company had been established in uh, sorry 1608 although the company had been established in 1600 itself its the first major voyage to india took place in 1608 the voyage was led by captain hawkins who landed at surat and following this went to the court of jahangir at agra theek okay? hai that was the mughal imperial capital what did he want he wanted permission from jahangir to establish a factory at surat did jahangir agree to this no why because the british were yet to prove themselves in the indian ocean right portuguese at this point of time were the undisputed naval power in the indian ocean region and jahangir did not want to risk angering the portuguese secondly the portuguese diplomats and representatives present at uh, agra were also acting against captain hawkins theek okay? hai so however due to portuguese influence in the mughal court he was unsuccessful in persuading jahangir to allow the british to set up a factory at surat as such in 1600 the british who were desperate to find a footing in india went and started looking outside the mughal empire kya dekha inko मसूली पटनम मसूली पटनम वॉज इज इन प्रेजेंट डे आंध्र प्रदेश इट वॉज पार्ट ऑफ द सल्तनत ऑफ गोलकोंडा रूल्ड बाई द कुतुब शाही डायनेस्टी ठीक है नाउ सिंस द सल्तनत ऑफ गोलकोंडा डिड नॉट हैव अ गुड रिलेशन विद द पोर्चुगीज दिस वॉज अ वायबल कैंडिडेट फॉर एन अलायंस विद द ब्रिटिश एंड इट वॉज इन सिक्सटीन इलेवन दैट द ब्रिटिश वर एबल टू ऑप्टेन permission from the sultan of golconda to establish their first factory in india at masuli patnam is this clear so first british factory in india kahan par masuli patnam located in which sultanate golconda ruled by which dynasty the kutub shahi dynasty then a major development took place in 1612 there was a naval battle just off the coast of surat known as the battle of suwali or wali theek hai this this was a battle between the portuguese and the british what was the result the british forces led by captain best defeated and thrashed the portuguese naval power right this was the indication that jahangir had been looking for as we have already discussed the portuguese did not share a very cordial relationship with any of the indian powers especially the indian muslim powers the indian powers were looking for a way to end portuguese influence in their territories and however this would have required them to come up with an alternative because india's overseas trade had become increasingly important for the indian rulers as well this alternative was provided by captain best in the form of the english east india company to jahangir तो अभी तक जो परमिशन नहीं मिल रही थी वो अब मिल जाएगी फॉलोइंग दिस विक्ट्री जहांगीर अलाउड द ब्रिटिश टू एस्टैब्लिश देयर फैक्ट्री एट सूरत तो सेकंड ब्रिटिश फैक्ट्री इन इंडिया सूरत 
फर्स्ट ब्रिटिश फैक्ट्री इन दी मुगल एम्पायर सूरत ठीक है इन 1615 दी इंग्लिश मोनार्क जेम्स दी फर्स्ट सेंट एन अंबेसडर टू दी कोर्ट ऑफ जहांगीर कौन था ये अंबेसडर सर थॉमस रो हु सक्सेसफुली परसुएडेड जहांगीर टू अलाउ दी ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी टू ट्रेड थ्रू आउट दी मुगल एम्पायर What had been granted by the Mughals only in the context of Surat till now was granted throughout the length and breadth of their extensive territories. Now the British had express permission from the Mughal Mughal Bacha to establish their factories across the territory of the Mughal Empire. Okay. In 1622, the Portuguese received a major setback, and the East India Company captured Hormuz. on the uh, on the mouth of the persian gulf okay in 1632 the east india company also obtained permission from the sultan of golconda to set up factories throughout his kingdom through a royal order known as the golden farman golden farman kyon bola gaya because this permission was given by the sultan of golconda in exchange for 500 gold coins गोलकोंडा के जो कॉइन्स थे उनको पगोडास बोला जाता था राइट सो दस बिकॉज ऑफ दिस 500 गोल्डन पगोडास गोल्डन फरमान क्या मिला इससे अंग्रेजों को परमिशन टू सेट अप फैक्ट्रीज थ्रू आउट द टेरिटरी ऑफ द गोलकोंडा सल्तनत ठीक है नाउ कमिंग टू द ब्रिटिश फैक्ट्रीज व्हाट आर फैक्ट्रीज इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ अर्ली मॉडर्न इंडियन हिस्ट्री दे वर प्लेसेज वेयर गुड्स वर स्टोर्ड एंड ट्रेडेड सो दे Warehouses, godowns, come showroom, right? They were established by obtaining permission from the local rulers. Without permission from the local rulers, they could not be established. Why? Because these factories were usually fortified, right? And there are certain actions, certain activities, and symbols which are always going to be related, controlled by the sovereign. Okay? For example. करेंसी इशू करना टैक्सेस इशू करना कलेक्ट करना या फिर फोर्ट्स को मेंटेन करना ऑल ऑफ दीज आर ऑलवेज सीन एज सॉवरेन प्रिवलेजेज नाउ स्टेट वॉज आउटसोर्सिंग दीज पावर्स टू अ थर्ड पार्टी ने इंडिया यूरोपियन कंपनी फॉर दैट परमिशन हैड टू बी ऑप्टेन ठीक है दे वर जनरली फोर्टिफाइड एंड यूजली सिचुएटेड इधर अलॉन्ग द कोस्ट और ऑन रिवर बैंक फैक्ट्रीज वर ऑल्सो ऑफ ग्रेट स्ट्रेटेजिक वैल्यू they were used as naval bases and gave the british easy access to the seas as well clear now here we have the various factories established by the british in india early factories the years in which they were established the ports which are situated along these factories and the significance of these factories the first british factory in india Masuli Patnam established in 1611 it was the first british factory in india second british factory in india surat established in 1612 13 it was the prince surat was the principal port of the mughals it was the most important mughal port and surat also emerged as the early headquarters of the east india company in western india third british factory और थर्ड इंपॉर्टेंट फैक्ट्री बालासोर कहां पे है प्रेजेंट डे ओडिशा इस्टेब्लिश इन 1633 दिस वाज़ दी फर्स्ट ब्रिटिश फैक्ट्री इन ईस्टर्न इंडिया नेक्स्ट मद्रास इस्टेब्लिश इन 1639 विच फोर्ट वाज बिल्ट ओवर हियर फोर्ट सेंट जॉर्ज इट सर्व एज दी हेडक्वार्टर्स ऑफ द मद्रास प्रेजिडेंसी वॉट वॉज दर्कमस्टांसिस अंडर विच दी कंपनी ऑप्टेन परमिशन टू इस्टेब्लिश दिस फैक्ट्री Francis Day who was the English agent of the East India Company at Madras was able to persuade the local ruler that is Darmala Venkatadari Nayaka he was the local representative of the Vijayanagar ruler to grant the East India Company a 3 mile long stretch along the coast and it is over here that the factory of Madras was established next Hogli in 1651 this was the earliest british factory in bengal next bombay in 1668 yahan pe kaun sa fort establish hua the bombay castle it served later on as the headquarters of the bombay presidency 
and the last one last important one calcutta established in 1698 and over here a fort known as fort st william was constructed it served as the headquarters of the calcutta or bengal presidency it is situated on the confluence of three villages gobindpur susanati and kalikata it is from the third of these villages that the settlement obtains its name calcutta and it served as the capital of british india till 1911 क्लियर है तो बताओ बिना देखे द करेक्ट ऑर्डर इन विच द फॉलोइंग फैक्ट्रीज वर इस्टैब्लिश बताओ करेक्ट ऑर्डर क्या होना चाहिए फोर थ्री टू वन अर्लीएस्ट बालासोर इस्टैब्लिश वेन सिक्सटीन थर्टी थ्री नेक्स्ट सिक्सटीन फिफ्टी टू हुगली नेक्स्ट सिक्सटीन सिक्सटी एट बॉम्बे एंड लास्टली सिक्सटीन नाइनटी एट कैलकटा यहां पे कौन सा फोर्ट इस्टैब्लिश किया फोर्ट सेंट विलियम बॉम्बे पर विच अमंग दीज वॉज द अर्लीएस्ट फैक्ट्री इस्टैब्लिश बाई द ब्रिटिश ऑन द ईस्टर्न कोस्ट बालासोर ठीक है विच ऑफ देम इज द फर्स्ट फैक्ट्री इस्टैब्लिश इन द महाराष्ट्र कोस्ट बॉम्बे है राइट वॉट वॉज द First British factory established on the Konkan coast. Surat. What was the first British factory to be established on the Coromandel coast? First British factory on the Northern Circus. बालासोर फर्स्ट इनलैंड फैक्ट्री इस्टैब्लिश बाय द ब्रिटिश इनलैंड फैक्ट्री अहमदाबाद ठीक है तो एक एक्स्ट्रा नोट लिख लो फर्स्ट इनलैंड फैक्ट्री इस्टैब्लिश बाय द ब्रिटिश अहमदाबाद राइट नाउ दैट वी हैव कवर्ड दिस next we come to the structure of the east india company what kind of a body was it was it a public sector enterprise or a private enterprise private enterprise can you be more specific it was a joint stock trading company funds for which were raised by taking out stocks in the english market and raising money from the general public and thus ownership of the company was in the hands of its shareholders कॉपरेट गवर्नेंस के बारे में थोड़ा आइडिया है अच्छा तो डिसीजन मेकिंग किसके हाथ में होती है ऑल द शेयर होल्डर्स और द प्रीमियम शेयर होल्डर्स विद द लार्जेस्ट शेयर इट इज द लार्ज शेयर होल्डर्स विच फॉर अ सबसेट ऑफ द शेयर होल्डर्स 
they have the power to appoint officials to govern the pack or govern the company these large shareholders were known as the court of proprietors and it is from among these court of proprietors that the top executive body consisting of abhi uh, jaise bolte hain board of directors na us samay it was known as the court of directors this was the top executive body of the east india company now the company had operations not only in britain but also overseas they even had territorial possessions and governance machineries overseas so for each of their overseas possessions they had a top ranking administrator known as a governor now in the earlier phase of british presence in india there were as many as three governors in india three british governors in india located where bombay madras and calcutta these governed over three separate presidencies so the company's territorial positions in india were not unified rather they were considered as three distinct entities the presidencies of bengal bombay and uh, madras right governors were assisted by deputy governors followed by traders factors and writers where traders being senior company officials who were responsible for actually affecting the trade between the company and the indian merchants buying and selling of goods factors were responsible for maintaining oversight over the individual factories of the east india company and writers were the accountants ye khata likhte the that is why they were known as the writers of the east india company theek okay? hai who used to appoint the governors of the east india company british parliament or british government neither of them it was a publicly owned joint stock trading company and thus both the appointment removal as well as transfer of all company officials was overseen directly by the court of directors theek hai to ab ye batao jo company ke administrators hai india mein were they appointed through any public examination open examination no initially nahi hota tha why because the court of directors did not need to conduct any examination for this they were appointed through a system of patronage right so whoever the officials may be in india their patrons were the court of directors initially the number of courtiers in the court of directors was 24 later the number was reduced to 18 okay and over time through a series of legislation some changes are going to be brought to the structure of the east india company but this was the structure of the east india company at the time of the early british conquest so battle of uh, buxar plassey the carnatic wars un sab ke period mein this was the structure is this clear theek okay. 
Now, if we look at the history of British rule in India, our task becomes more convenient if we understand the basic driving force behind British colonialism. Okay? So, colonialism ko alag alag historians ne, alag alag scholars ne, they have interpreted it in different manners. What are some of the prominent interpretations? What kind of a system was the British Raj in India? Was it primarily a political system? Was it primarily an administrative system? Was it primarily a cultural force? Or was it primarily an economic mechanism? Kya tha? It was primarily an economic mechanism. So, colonialism is primarily an economic phenomenon. which rests upon the creation of an unequal relationship between the colonizing power and the colonized people, between the mother country and the colonies. This relationship is characterized by the one way flow of resources from the colonies towards the mother country resulting in the enrichment of the colonizer and the impoverishment of the colonized. Okay? As such, the highest priority for the colonizer is always going to be the smooth operation of the economic mechanisms that facilitate this drain of wealth. Okay? Now, this is the classical Marxist interpretation of colonialism, first suggested by Whom? Marxist is the first time. Who has suggested it? Marx. Now, Marx had using this ideology divided the British colonialism of India into two phases. the phase of mercantile capitalism and the phase of industrial capitalism. Okay? But Marx was writing in 1848, 1850 around British Empire would last another 100 years in India, another 90 years in India. And later, 
an indian marxist scholar and historian r c dutt while making his study of british colonialism in india used the marxist uh, framework in order to give the third phase of british colonialism and this was financial capital is this much clear now what both marx and rc dutt argue is that with the evolving economic priorities of the british with respect to india their colonial policies are also going to evolve namely their political administrative social and cultural policies are going to evolve in response to the changing nature of british economy and thus the changing british economic policy kitna clear hai and herein we come across these three distinct phases the phase of mercantile capitalism industrial capitalism and financial capitalism the british modus operandi economically speaking during the phase of mercantile capitalism was what were they exporting large amounts of british manufactured goods to india nay by this point of time british industrialization had not started rather the uh, direction of trade was the reverse indian finished products were in great demand in european market therefore their objective was to export indian finished goods to european markets theek okay? hai however they were not the only players who were associated in this some other european powers were also involved in the export of indian goods to european markets and thus in order to ensure the maxima maximization of profits the british wanted to create a monopoly theek okay? hai this is not only going to allow them to increase the volume of profits that they can uh, obtain out of this trade relationship but it is also going to be able to reduce the drain of wealth that is constantly draining britain's wealth towards india because british are not in direct control of india politically speaking for exchanging these goods they are having to bring large amounts of british bullion to india this is actually acting as a drain of wealth on british uh, on the british economy in their quest for monopoly they became engaged in some conflict 
namely the triangular conflict against the portuguese and the dutch in the 17th century and then in the 18th century the anglo french conflict the priority of preservation of their monopoly also brought them into conflict with some indian powers namely the powers of bengal nawab of bengal but they did not want to expand their empire beyond these early areas of conquest why because expansion of territory would have involved more war which would have meant more expense it would also have resulted in the establishment of british governance over these areas usko maintain karne ke liye aur kharcha karna padta right and thus their political policy was one of conservative defense and expansion theek hai how about their social and cultural policy did they want to interfere aggressively in the indian society and culture and engineer it in a major way at this point of time nahi uski zarurat nahi thi yahan pe aur wo karne ke liye kharcha bahut zyada karna padta hai investment bahut zyada karna padta hai however they had come into contact with or they had come into possession of certain indian regions so their idea was to understand indians better in order to effectively govern them minimal interference and better governance how about their economic policy it was focused primarily upon revenue reforms with the agenda of stabilizing the company's revenues in india okay beyond that they were not looking for avenues to invest their accumulated capital in order to bring about any kind of industrial growth or development in india this all changed from 1813 onwards with the beginning of industrial capitalism the industrial revolution which had started as early as 1760 had entered into a high gear by the second decade of the 19th century by the 1810s right in response to this the priorities of the british were also shifting earlier they were importing indian finished products now they were manufacturing finished products in britain itself in the context of india how did these new industrial priorities view india what was their agenda to transform india into a supplier of raw materials and a consumer of british products by this point of time the british have also eliminated all other european rivals and they have established a strong foundation for their empire in india so are they going to follow the policy of non intervention politically speaking or are they going to seek to aggressively expand their empire in order to maximize their access to indian markets and raw materials kya hoga aggressive expansion with regards to indian society and culture 
are the british going to maintain their earlier hands off approach or are they going to get intimately involved in the dirty process of social engineering kya karenge they are going to get actively involved in social engineering their idea is to transform indian tastes so that the demand for british goods may be increased among indians they wanted to anglicize indians westernize indians so the project of anglicization or westernization is going to take place and finally with regards to their economic policy are the british going to be interested in developing any economic assets in india yes karenge kya karenge railways ports mines canals etc as a way to supply more and more raw material to the british economy and so that through this connectivity infrastructure british markets or sorry british products may be able to penetrate the indian market as deeply as possible theek okay? hai then the british received a major shock in 1857 with the great revolt they found out that many of these policies had been causing a great degree of resentment among indians secondly by this point of time the british had already created a large empire and on the horizon there was no other power in the entire world who could match them when it came to their imperial status okay so they were also quite complacent and now in response to this ek aur cheez hoga along with this ek aur cheez hoga the industrial revolution of britain also started to heat up okay so britain mein jo working wages hain they uh, attained a stage known as the middle income trap so the returns on british investment in britain itself would become increasingly marginal so returns utne zyada mil nahi payenge so britain was not no longer the most uh, conducive place to invest more and more british wealth wo kahan pe hoga ab india mein hoga so they wanted to make investments or they wanted india to emerge as a parking space for british capital an avenue for investment right secondly the shock given to them by the great revolt of 1857 had warned them of any further territorial aggression so now what is the policy that they are going to adopt towards the remaining indian powers one of hostility or one of uh, accommodation but incorporation accommodation but incorporation so the british are going to now start working seriously towards the agenda of transforming the remaining indian princes and powers into their junior partners and collaborators okay so active collaboration and the abandoning of imperialism social and cultural policy the british had already burned their hands right they knew that further social intervention is going to create even more resentment which is not in the best interest of the longevity of the british empire so ab kya policy apnayenge by this point of time there are also a number of pseudo scientific stories which are floating around one of them is known as social darwinism herbert spencer ne diya tha what does it say what is darwinism basic premise kya hai survival of the fittest right only those species survive which are able to evolve and adapt to the ever changing environment which they inhabit similarly it is the destiny of a small group of people to maintain their mastery over the others theek okay? hai this is going to result in the emergence of concepts such as the white man's burden wo log ye bolenge 
that we are destined to be the masters of the world because we are white and because we are superior. In contrast, Indians are uncivilized, barbaric, backward, superstitious and they deserve to be brought into the light of civilization with the British firmly assisting them. Okay? So, ideas are going to emerge such as the white man's burden, civilizing mission, etc., which is going to become the basis for a policy of racial segregation. Okay? So, Indians are going to start becoming actively discriminated even as matter of state policy. Secondly, the British learned from their better experience in the great revolt of 1857 that if Hindus and Muslims are able to unite, British empire in India is always going to be threatened. So, what is the specific policy that they adopted towards these communities? The policy of divide and rule. And finally, what was their economic policy? The use of British financial institutions to drain away the profits accruing from Indian investments. Secondly, since they were in control of the economic policy as a whole, they also began manipulating the exchange rate in favor of the British pound, in favor of British industries and exports, right. They were, uh, they did not allow the Indian industries to flourish. Their earlier priorities of using India as a captive market and a supplier of raw material remained intact as well even now. And therefore, they continued to develop connectivity infrastructure which connected not regions of high population, but regions where some mineral resources were found with the ports. This resulted in unbalanced economic growth, etc. Okay? So, with this simple chart, we have outlined the pattern of economic, uh, sorry, colonial policies towards Indians during the entirety of the British rule. Mercantile capitalism ka time period kya hai? From the beginning till about 1813. Industrial capitalism ka time period? 1813 to 1857. And finally, financial capitalism ka? 18, uh, sorry, uh, 1857 onwards. Clear hai? Itna samaj mein aaya hai? Right. Now, mercantile capitalism, 1757 to 1813. During this phase, the East India Company purchased finished products, especially textiles from Indian manufacturers and traded them for a profit in Europe. Before 1757, since the demand for British products in India was low, the East India Company had to balance its trade with India by importing precious metals or bullion to India. This was causing a huge drain on the British economy. After 1757, after its victory at Plassey, what did the British start doing? They start started utilizing the revenues collected from Bengal in order to purchase Indian goods. So, the revenues of Bengal were ploughed back into British trade. The phase of drain of wealth and direct plunder started. Bengal's revenue was used to purchase Indian goods and English bullion stopped coming to India. Moreover, the company's employees amassed huge fortunes by extorting money. Company ki ab lati chal rahi thi, so company officials ka raj shuru ho gaya. They began uh, punishing, they began pushing the Indian merchants and artisans to pay them money. So, zamindars, merchants, peasants, artisans, they were directly looted by the English merchants, oh, sorry, English officials. Since the company was not familiar with Indian manufacturers, it relied upon certain Indian agents. These Indian agents were known as Banians or Dadans or Gumasthas. Banians, kaun the? Indian agents of the 
ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी हु कंडक्टेड ट्रेड सॉरी टू कंडक्टेड ट्रेड्स ऑन इट्स बिहाफ इन रिटर्न फॉर अ कमीशन ठीक है दे वर एजेंट एम्प्लॉयड बाई द कंपनी सिंस द कंपनी ऑफिशियल डिड नॉट नो वेयर टू परचेज गुड्स फ्रॉम वेयर टू सिक्योर दप्लाई ऑफ रॉ मटीरियल फ्रॉम सो दे वर एंगेज बाई द कंपनी टू कंडक्ट ट्रेड ऑन इट बिहाफ एंड इन रिटर्न दे रिसीव द कमीशन दादान कौन थे the word dadani comes from the Persian word dadan which means advance or a लोन ठीक है तो इट वॉज दादान फॉर पार्ट ऑफ द पुटिंग आउट सिस्टम पुटिंग आउट सिस्टम क्या होता है सी एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम द इंडियन इकोनॉमी वॉज नॉन इंडस्ट्रियलाइज वॉट एवर इंडस्ट्रियल प्रोडक्शन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग वॉज टेकिंग प्लेस दैट वॉज टेकिंग प्लेस एट एज पार्ट ऑफ द कॉटेज इंडस्ट्रीज राइट अब कॉटेज इंडस्ट्रीज में डू दी आर्टिजन और दीपल हु आर एंगेज इन दीज हाउस होल्ड एक्टिविटीज मैन्युफैक्चरिंग एक्टिविटीज डू दे हैव एक्सेस टू अ लार्ज अमाउंट ऑफ कैपिटल और आर दे ऑलवेज शॉर्ट ऑफ मनी दे आर ऑलवेज शॉर्ट ऑफ मनी एंड दस देयर प्रोडक्टिव पोटेंशियल इज लिमिटेड बाई दी पॉसिटी ऑफ फंड राइट अगर उनके पास ज्यादा फंड होंगे दे विल बी एबल टू may be engage more workers may be uh, purchase the right quantity of raw materials etc the company was interested in obtaining indian textiles primarily these textiles were being manufactured by these handicrafts uh, artisans however they lacked capital so company ne kya kiya they started the practice of giving them loans or dadans advances dene lag gaye and since the company could not have uh, come into direct contact with these uh, indian artisans they started to use middlemen known as known as the dadani merchants theek hai to kaun the ye the dadans were middlemen who facilitated the advancement of loans from the company to indian artisans and uh collected finished goods from them for the company is this clear ye the dadans gumashtas kaun the this was a general term used for the indian accountant notary or translator used by the company and its officials in india क्लियर है पक्का ठीक कमिंग टू दी सेकेंड फेज इंडस्ट्रियल कैपिटलिज्म बाय 
this point of time the industrial revolution in britain had accelerated leading to a shift in its economic priorities kya kis perspective se ab india ko dekh rahe the as a supplier of raw material and a consumer of british goods further with the introduction of the charter act of 1813 this act ended the monopoly of the east india company with respect to indian trade right um, indian markets were open to the british industrialists India now was to become a supplier of raw material and a market for British finished products. Indian territory in response was annexed at an unprecedented pace to ensure direct control, and also the British introduced the system of one-way free trade in order to promote British industries at the cost of cost of Indian handicraft. Further, a grand scheme of social intervention through reformative legislation and the introduction of English education was undertaken. During this period. a number of attendant features could be visible such as the large scale deindustrialization that is destruction of indian handicraft industries the ruralization of india that is decline of urban settlements and population and the commercialization of agriculture and lastly we have the phase of financial capitalism during this phase the british invested their plundered wealth back to india with the objective of further exploiting it large scale infrastructure development was for funded by the british capital to indian public risk for development of railways at indian public risk for the development of railways road posts uh, telegraph ports etc right indian industries also started emerging but they faced stiff competition and were not given any protection the british used their financial institutions such as banks export houses and management agencies to ship away profit to britain they also man manipulated the exchange rate to give british products an edge over indian goods the infrastructure development was motivated by commercial aims thus it resulted in unbalanced regional development and core industries were prioritized over commercial goods industries thus any industrial development that was taking place in india could not benefit the common people it could benefit only the people of britain okay as a result of these three phases of capitalism we can see the transformation that has taken place between the beginning of the 18th century and the mid of the 20th century in the beginning of the 18th century in 1707 at the time of the death of aurangzeb india controlled roughly 24% of the global trade by 1947 this had come down to 2% only in contrast britain which was at 2% at the same time had risen to control more than 25% of the total global trade therefore the britain uh, therefore britain systematically impoverished india by its economic policy clear hai now some break theek hai so kitna der ka break hota hai aapka half an hour so it is 458 right now 530 pe dobara reconvene karte hain thank you chalo thank you
वेलकम बैक गाइज आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल आवाज आ रही है ना राइट थैंक यू सो नाउ वी मूव ऑन टू अ न्यू थीम इन मॉडर्न इंडियन हिस्ट्री अ ग्लिम्स ऑफ एटीन सेंचुरी इंडिया where we have to address primarily two simultaneous processes first of all the decline of the mogal empire specifically the factors associated with this decline and secondly the the rise of the regional powers on the graveyard of the mughal empire okay now as for the factors responsible for the mughal decline the process of decline set in almost immediately after the death of aurangzeb and uh, different sets of factors have been suggested namely the mistakes of aurangzeb including his bigoted religious policy the breach of the accord between the mughals and the rajputs due to aurangzeb's actions his aggressive policy of territorial expansion in the deccan region which brought him into direct conflict with the marathas and similarly his actions which brought him into conflict with another with another major political and cultural popular movement to the west that is the sikh power now the framework of religious tolerance peaceful coexistence universal brotherhood and secularism had been incorporated into the mughal administrative system by akbar aurangzeb due to a number of factors seems to have reversed it and reversed this policy quite radically his reign was associated with activities such as the reimposition of jizya and pilgrimage tax what was the jizya it was a poll tax collected by islamic powers from their non islamic subjects only on the basis of their religious identity pilgrimage tax kya tha it was a tax extracted from non muslim pilgrims who visited important places of pilgrimage so both these had been removed by akbar they were reintroduced he also reintroduced the policy of forcible religious conversions especially of prisoners of war 
the long discarded practice of destruction of temples was also reintroduced by him he also introduced the practice of actively promoting muslims interest in matters of state employment and what was the result of this the harmony which the moguls had been able to achieve between muslim and non muslim interests that was suddenly broken the mughal empire suddenly lost its support from the non muslim population which was the bulk of the population of the empire and thus the moguls had to face a increasingly frequent and increasingly more and more intense rebellions and pockets of resistance from non muslims among the rajputs akbar had adopted a policy of subordination and collaboration he had adopted a policy of non intervention in the internal matters of rajputs however after the death of raja jaswant singh of jodhpur the ruler of marwar aurangzeb directly intervened in the succession issue which was considered as a violation of the mughal policy towards the rajputs who had been ensured that a policy of non intervention is going to be followed against towards them this uh, feeling of betrayal was most palpable among the marwari rajputs but it also threatened other rajputs ki aaj jo jodhpur mein intervene kiya hai maybe next time chittorgarh mein kare right so this issue emerged secondly since akbar all the mughal rulers had ensured that there is going to be no intervention especially in matters of religious activities and rajput rulers had been assured that they will not be required to collect and submit jizya to the center however the demand for jizya was raised by aurangzeb in 1679 from the state of mewar this naturally led to open resistance and for 20 years aurangzeb had to fight against the rajputs both the marwadi and mewadis formed a coalition against the moguls and this uh, harmed the consolidated position of the mughal empire the mughals had to spend large am amount of resources commit a large number of men for containing these rebellions similarly aurangzeb took a very aggressive stance towards the deccan region till the reign of shah jahan while bijapur and golconda had been brought under mughal overlordship direct mughal rule had not been extended in these regions therefore shah jahan had very wisely maintained these two deccani muslim sultanates as a buffer zone between the mughals and the marathas aurangzeb on the other hand was very aggressive in this region he wanted direct control of the coromandel coast by his point, by uh, this point of time the value of the coromandel coast with the perspective of external trade 
विज अज गुजरात कोस्ट वॉज एक्चुअली फोर टाइम्स इन वैल्यू सो द कॉर्मेंडल कोस्ट वॉज फोर टाइम्स एज वैल्यूबल एज दी गुजरात कोस्ट देर फोर मुगल्स को इस पर डायरेक्ट कंट्रोल स्टैब्लिश करना जरूरी हो गया था दैट इज वाई ही अटैक्ड बोथ गोलकोंडा एंड बीजापुर एनेक्स देयर टेरिटरीज एंड ब्रॉड दम अंडर देयर डायरेक्ट कंट्रोल हियर ही हैड मेड अ मिस कैलकुलेशन ही परसीव द मराठा मूवमेंट सिंपली एज अ पोलिटिकल मूवमेंट बट इन रियालिटी इट वॉज अ पॉप्युलर कल्चरल एंड सोशल मूवमेंट फॉर मराठा नेशन हुड राइट एंड ही वॉज नॉट एबल टू एंटिसिपेट द इंटेंसिटी ऑफ द मराठा रेजिस्टेंस अगेंस्ट मुगल इंकर्जन इन टू वॉट द मराठा बिलीव वॉज देयर जोन ऑफ इंफ्लुएंस ठीक है एंड दिस ब्रॉट हिम इन टू prolonged conflict against the marathas which the mughals were not able to suppress they were not able to convincingly win for any uh, long period of time this resulted in the loss of mughal prestige they also had to invest commit a large number of resources in this region uh, large amount of manpower was exhausted Aurangzeb remained in the Deccan region for the last 25 years of his reign thus neglecting the other areas especially the north western frontier where some enemies of the Mughals were gathering forces right so this uh, contributed to the decline of the Mughal empire similarly his decision to execute the ninth Sikh guru Guru Tegh Bahadur had the unintended consequence of elevating the executed guru to the status of a martyr he emerged as a symbol around which the sikhs could uh, mobilize right and it is what allowed the 10th Sikh guru guru gobind singh to create the khalsa a military faction of the sikh community which transformed the sikh community of punjab into not only a culturally and a religiously distinct whole but into an ambitious and emergent political power theek okay? hai so these were the mistakes of aurangzeb clear hai itna some historians on the other hand have cited the crisis of personality bearing the biggest responsibility for the decline of the mogal empire now these historians have assumed that the mogal empire was a highly centralized one and thus the emperor was the linchpin around which the entire structure of mughal administration revolved so what were the desirable qualities of the emperor he should be an extremely capable administrator he should be well versed in economic matters he should have a good grasp on general administration and he should be a gifted general as well right did aurangzeb successors have these qualities nahi aurangzeb's weak successors were not suitable for this role and thus the administration began to disintegrate unravel is this clear these historians also point to the rising
personal ambitions of the nobility it is not that there was no capable person who may have righted the course of the mughal decline who may have stabilized the empire but by this point of time due to the decline of imperial authority all of them had started looking towards their own vested interests so personalities such as uh, chin kilich khan or murshid kuli khan or uh, asaf ja etc sorry uh, this uh, safdar jang etc who should actually have uh, intervened in order to safeguard the empire now over now began uh, deliberately accelerating the decline of the empire so that they could carve out more and more uh, power for themselves more and more territory for themselves this was a crisis of personality similarly some institutional factors have also been cited such as a crisis in the mansabdari system now in order to understand this mansabdari crisis we should first understand what the mansabdari system actually was so what was it it was introduced by akbar in order to organize the mughal bureaucracy and aristocracy into a rank based merit based hierarchy okay it was a heterogeneous body wherein each mansabdar that is official had two kinds of rank a zat rank and a sawar rank zat rank denoting the personal rank of the official and sawar rank denoting his military responsibilities these officials may have been paid either in cash or in the form of land grants known as jagirs they used to be frequently transferred from place to place so that they could not develop roots and thus possibly challenge the authority of the emperor later on theek hai now isme crisis kaise aayega the effective functioning of the mansabdari system depended upon the maintenance of the functional relationship between the emperor and the mansabdar the higher ranking mansabdars were paid in the form of jagirs or land grant and so that they remain loyal and uh, actively work in the interests of the emperor kya requirement tha basic requirement kya hai ki inka reward bhi match karna chahiye inki loyalty or service ko so for the for the mansabdari system to function well it was necessary that the empire keep expanding continuously right this happened till the time of aurangzeb but by the time of aurangzeb the rate at which the mansabdari system sorry sorry uh, territorial expansion was expanding that had come down so rate of uh, expansion was slowing down at the same time with the incorporation of new regions into the uh, mughal empire the native nobility had also to be incorporated into the mughal aristocracy to so, unko bhi mansab ranks dene the jagir dene the right so rate at which the empire was expanding was much lower than the rate at which the number of jagirdars number of mansabdars was increasing so ek mismatch create hua right now the mansabdari system had a number of different groups within it a number of religious and ethnic groups so isme iranis the turanis the hindustanis the deccanis the rajput the afghans the kai sare groups the right now they are going to start grouping together in order to promote their group interest against the interests of other groups of mansabdars right ab jagiron ki chabi kiske hath mein hai emperor ke hath mein all of them are going to try and establish their own control on the emperor so emperor ke paas koi agency reh jayega nahi he is simply going to become a puppet theek hai and as a result because of this intense competition what is going to happen a lot of infighting and intrigue is going to take place that is the mansabdari crisis fourthly another institutional factor the jagirdari crisis that is also associated with the mansabdari crisis now as i have mentioned mansab was composed of two different ranks 
जात एंड सवार रंग राइट फॉर द स्टेट जात एंड सवार वॉट डिड इट इंटेल एक्सपेंडिचर जात रैंक इंटेल्ड सैलरी एक्सपेंडिचर एंड सवार रैंक इंटेल्ड मिलिट्री एक्सपेंडिचर सैलरी एक्सपेंडिचर इनकर्ड बाय द स्टेट टू पे ऑल देयर मनसबदार्स and military expenditure incurred by each of the mansabdars on behalf of the state to maintain their military contingents clear hai itna acha now with the shortage of jagirs what is going to happen is the state going to be in a position to pay its uh, mansabdars regularly and in the amount which they expect nahi mil payega not every mansabdar with the same zat rank is going to receive the same size of jagir or the same uh, yield from their jagirs kisi ko achhi jagir milegi kisi ko kharab milegi kisi ko badi jagir milegi kisi ko choti milegi theek hai secondly the state is also not going to be able to ensure that the jagirdars are fulfilling their military commitments also so military strength of the empire that is also going to decline and the mughal state how had it been created what was the process by which it came to power military conquest expansion ke piche kya tha military conquest maintenance defense ke piche military power and if the military strength of the empire weakens the empire is going to be always perpetually at the threat of crumbling theek okay? hai So that is one way in which the Jagirdari crisis affected the fortunes of the Mughal Empire. Secondly, since the Jagirdars are not being satisfied because of the shortage of Jagirs, what are they going to do? Are they going to absorb the burden themselves, or are they going to shift the burden to those below them? They are going to shift the burden. Nor normal human tendency होता है. So, इनके नीचे कौन है? The peasants, right? and they are going to charge illegal cesses illegally tax the peasants it is going to result in the burden of taxation rising theek hai and this once again is going to create certain fragmentary forces within the empire kya hoga iski wajah se are the peasants going to be happy no they are going to be unhappy resentful and resent breeds rebellion right and herein we come to the next institutional factor that is agrarian crisis with the rising military expenditure the crisis within the mansabdari and jagirdari system the burden of all this added expenditure fell on the peasants right now the bulk of the peasantry muslim or non muslim bulk of the peasantry what was the nature of their grievance against the state was it religious or non religious non religious they were unhappy because of economic factors but because of the religious divide between the peasantry and the ruling class this was very effectively given a religious color and this became even more complicated because of the changing nature or the changing attitude of the mughal aristocracy towards religion from the atmosphere of tolerance ab kya ho raha tha intolerance from the atmosphere of equality inequality therefore the majority non muslim peasantry could easily be mobilized by their local leaders into politico religious uprisings against the state 
and who were the natural leaders of the peasants at the local level the local landed elites traditional elites jo the they were zamindars what is the general pattern in which uh, or the way in which uh, indian villages are settled kya basis hota hai settlement ka people belonging to the same caste or same religion usually make the same settlements theek hai so not only were the zamindars the economic leaders of their regions they were also the caste leaders or the religious leaders of their region thus their leadership was much more effective much more localized theek hai iska result kya hua in non stop agrarian rebellions ka result kya hua impact kya pada बताओ मिलिट्री एक्सपेंडिचर इज गोइंग टू इंक्रीज एग्रीकल्चरल रेवेन्यू इज गोइंग टू डिक्रीज एंड ओवरऑल द पावर ऑफ द स्टेट दैट इज गोइंग टू डिक्लाइन फ्रैगमेंट्री पॉलिटिक्स इज गोइंग टू इमर्ज एज दी नॉर्म इज गोइंग टू इमर्ज एज दी डॉमिनेंट पैटर्न ठीक है further some other factors have been cited such as aur batao technological backwardness now if we are saying that the moguls were technologically backward it is always going to be in comparison to somebody else they were technologically backward in comparison to the europeans who by the 18th century had entrenched themselves in indian commerce and were getting actively and increasingly more involved in indian politics the europeans had undergone the renaissance reformation the enlightenment and from the second half of the 18th century onwards they had also started experiencing the industrial revolution this had transformed europe politically intellectually economically and socially the overall effect of this transformation was the modernization of europe from a feudal monarchical polity in which the bulk of the subject population was simply controlled and acted as a mute spectator dancing along the tune being played by the ruling class from that it was transformed into a modern nation state concept such as citizenship equality liberty etc they were enshrined many of these polities also adopted liberal constitution some of them even underwent revolution mughal empire mein kya ho raha tha aisa koi transformation ho raha tha nahi ho raha tha therefore the general citizenry of these european nations were actively involved and invested in the process of national development in india the bulk of the population was not concerned विद वेदर दी रूलर वॉज इंडियन और यूरोपियन ठीक है एक तो ये है इंटेलेक्चुअली ऑल्सो मॉडर्नाइजेशन इंटेल्ड क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग रीजनिंग द एप्लीकेशन ऑफ लॉजिक इंडिविजुअलिज्म ह्यूमनिज्म टू प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ गवर्नेंस टू प्रिंसिपल प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ इकोनॉमिक एक्सचेंज टू प्रिंसिपल ऑफ सोशल रिलेशनशिप एक्सेट्रा इंडिया रिमेन्ड मेडिवल Uh, when it comes to the intellectual setup economically 
open competition mercantilism international trade here european powers were playing a leading role while indians remained at the receiving end of european enterprise and socially europe mein equality was increasingly becoming the basis for social interaction india mein nahi tha right the system was highly unequal there were several restrictions to progress barriers to progress the social uh, makeup of india could be categorized or could be envisioned as a uniquely isolated silos with very little interaction from outside group the society was insular inward looking timid europe mein aisa nahi tha iska result technologically speaking kya tha european agriculture industry and military far outstripped indian agriculture economy and uh, military right so the biggest beneficiaries of these developments were european commerce trade and manufacturing along with european military these were the basis for real power right military or economic power jahan pe moguls ab lag behind kar rahe the that was one reason another factor which has been cited batao foreign invasions in the beginning of the 18th century or in the 18th century namely two important invasions nadir shah of persia invading the mughal empire in 1739 and ahmad shah abdali in 1740s to 60s 48 se lekar ke 61 tak kai baar usne invade kiya gave a crushing defeat not only to the mughals but also to the marathas in the third battle of panipat 1761 what was the result of this till now in the eyes of europeans and the other enemies of the moguls the moguls seemed invincible kabhi haarte hi nahi the now that myth was shattered suddenly and their enemies are going to get emboldened right what else aur kya factor ho sakta hai batao the rise of regional powers as mughal authority receded state formation started taking place at the regional level many of the former territories of the mughal empire broke apart and many of the many new states emerged by successfully rebelling against the mughals and as these uh, regional kingdoms consolidated their power it perpetually made these regions inaccessible to the moguls in any meaningful way thus the territorial uh, context of their empire kept on shrinking continuously they were never able to regain themselves aur dheere 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 karke they are going to get more and more marginalized theek hai so these are the factors which are responsible for the decline of the mughal empire dusra kaun sa process hai the rise of regional kingdoms as the mughal empire began declining from uh, aurangzeb's death onwards a number of regional kingdoms emerged which can be broadly classified into three categories firstly the successor states secondly the rebel states and thirdly the independent states successor states included powers such as hyderabad sorry bengal hyderabad and avadh formerly they were part of the mughal empire in fact they were different provinces or subas of the mughal empire their founders were therefore also part of the mughal provincial administration 
they had primarily been appointed in these various regions as the provincial governors. With the waning Mughal central authority, they decided to institute some changes in local administration. One of the main changes that they affected was to disrupt the separation of powers that the Mughals had affected at the provincial level. The Mughals had very wisely done one thing that jo administrative and financial functions the at the provincial level, they had vested them in two different officials. So, that uh, one official who is in charge of general administration, he will never be able to carve out his own empire because the person who is in charge of financial administration that is uh, revenue as well as expenditure, he will always act as a check against the ambitions of the local governor. So, in order to establish their undisputed authority in these provinces, the founders of these kingdoms, ye kya karenge? Jo division hai, separation of powers hai, isko remove kar denge. And they are going to conjoin the offices of Nazim and Diwan. So, Nizamat or Diwani functions ko ye dono ek dousse se merge kar denge. Thus, they are going to be able to establish themselves as virtually independent dynastic monarchs, right. Since they are successors of Mughal administration, their administration is also going to resemble Mughal administration very closely. So, officials ka nomenclature same rahega for example, the various uh, institutions uh, they are going to remain the same, various administrative practices they are also going to remain the same. Obviously, with the passage of time, some evolution, regional evolution is going to take place, but they are going to be closely patterned on the basis of Mughal administration only. Ek or unique cheese dekhne ke liye milta hai, that although all these states had emerged as virtually uh, sorry, independent, none of them broke away in absolute terms from Mughal authority. Although all of them emerged as virtually independent, they continued to recognize the overall suzerainty of the Mughal emperor. Why? Because it was politically convenient for them to do so. Mughal emperor was weak. Tha. He could not have in any meaningful way affected any change at the ground level in any of these provinces. But he was the source of authority. In the eyes of their people, of their subjects and other nobles, these people became legitimate rulers of their kingdoms because they had been appointed by the Mughal emperor. Okay? So, Mughal emperor was used as a rubber stamp by them. Then come the rebel states, states such as the Sikh kingdom of Punjab and the Maratha empire. Now, how had they come into existence? By successfully rebelling against Mughal authority. That means, they controlled regions which formerly were part of the Mughal empire, but they had created their empire by successfully rebelling against them. Okay? So, is there going to be any similarity between their administration and Mughal administration? Yes, kuch similarity to hoga hi hoga, right? Some vestiges of Mughal administration will be carried forward into their administrative system. But is the degree of similarity going to be the same as that of the successor states? No. And more importantly, are they going to recognize the overlordship of the Mughal emperor? No. They are going to consider the Mughal emperor, emperor to be their equal and their adversary. Okay? And finally, we have the independent kingdoms. Those are areas which were never under the direct control of the Mughals or were too far away. These included polities such as the Rajput kingdoms and Mysore or Travancore, etc. Is there going to be any similarity between their administration and Mughal administration? No, because in regions mein Mughal administration is not. Or raha bhi hai to indirect rule raha hai, direct rule nahi raha hai. 
so their administrative mechanisms have developed organically clear so these are the three types of regional powers which emerged during the 18th century now some of the more important ones the table yahan pe diya hua hai uske through aap dekh sakte ho the name of the kingdom year of establishment founder and capital first bengal established in 1713 by murshid kuli khan with its capital at murshidabad secondly the maratha empire under the peshwas also established in 1713 by the first peshwa balaji vishwanath capital at pune third avadh in 1722 established by saadat hasan khan who took the titles of burhanul mulk and alija with their first capital at faizabad which was later shifted to lucknow hyderabad established 1724 by chin kilich khan who took the titles of nizamul mulk or asafja with its capital at hyderabad then mysore established in 1761 by hyder ali did hyder ali ever take the title of sultan no he simply remained bakshi or commander in chief it was his son and successor tipu who took the title of sultan so hyder ali throughout his tenure remained as regent and commander of the rulers of which dynasty wodeyar dynasty while the wodeyar rulers resided in the traditional capital of mysore hyder ali established his headquarters at seringapatnam or shirangapatnam and sikh power in punjab was established and consolidated in 1799 by maharaja ranjit singh with its capital at lahore theek okay? hai so these are the various regional kingdoms to have emerged in the 18th century now there are some questions i want you to take 5 10 minutes to attempt them and then we can discuss
डन गाइज चलिए क्वेश्चन नंबर वन विद रेफरेंस टू द एंट्री ऑफ यूरोपियन पावर्स इन टू इंडिया विच वन ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट बताओ आंसर इज ए द पोर्चुगीज कैप्चर्ड गोवा इन फोर्टीन नाइनटी नाइन वाई इज दिस इन करेक्ट इयर वॉज फिफ्टीन हंड्रेड एंड टेन कैन यू नेम द पर्सन इन्वॉल्व विद दिस वॉज द पोर्चुगीज गवर्नर एल्बो करकी Goa before this was in control of the Sultanate of Bijapur, ruled by the Adil Shah dynasty. This answer is A. It is not correct. Just to be sure, the other factory, uh, the other uh, statements, the English opened their first factory in South India at Masuli Patnam. Correct, in 1611. Mein. In Eastern India, the English East, English company opened its first factory in Odisha in 1633, where Balasore. And the, under the leadership of Duple, the French occupied Madras in 1746. So this, these were the circumstances behind the first Anglo, oh, sorry, Anglo-French war, and the first Carnatic war. Right. So answer is A. That is incorrect. Second, Hooghly was used as a base of piracy in the Bay of Bengal by Portuguese. Answer is A. Third, in the year 1613, where was the English East India Company given permission? to set up a factory or trading post at surat following which battle battle of swali number 4 which of the following was the first fort constructed by the british in india fort st george kahan par madras answer is b fort william constructed by the dutch at cochin theek hai Fort Saint George at Madras, Fort Saint Davis, David near Madras uh, by the uh, Dutch, and Fort Saint Angelo. This I am not able to recall. But in uh, the correct answer, here is Fort Saint George. Right? Ah, Fort Saint William is the British fort at Calcutta. Fort William was the Dutch fort at uh, Cochin. Question number five. Consider the following. Number one. Assessment of land revenue on the basis of nature of soil and the quality of crops. Number two. Use of mobile cannons in warfare. Number three. Cultivation of tobacco and red chilies. Which one of the following was or were introduced in India by the English? D. None of them. Assessment of uh, land revenue on the basis of nature of the soil and quality of crops. I had been in practice ever since Sher Shah Suri's period. Use of mobile cannons in warfare, not the Portuguese. Mughals leke aaye the, right? Babar and cultivation of tobacco and red chilies introduced by the Portuguese. Answer is D. None of these. Next practice questions number one. Arrange the following European powers in chronological sequence as per their arrival in India from earliest to latest. C. Three, two, one, four. पहले सबसे पोर्चुगीज देन डच देन ब्रिटिश इंग्लिश एंड फाइनली डेन्स सेकेंड टूवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ द फिफ्टीन सेंचुरी विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग फैक्टर्स कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटेड टू द डिस्कवरी ऑफ न्यू ट्रेड रूट्स टू इंडिया एंड द ईस्ट इंडीज बाय यूरोपियन पावर्स नंबर वन क्या आंसर बताया बी फॉर बॉम्बे अच्छा क्या है बी वन टू थ्री एंड फोर ओनली फिफ्थ वाला क्या है इंटरनल फ्यूट्स ऑफ सक्सेशन इन इंडियन प्रिंसली स्टेट ये नहीं है दिस वी हैड ऑलरेडी डिस्कस राइज ऑफ नेशन स्टेट्स अंडर स्ट्रॉन्ग मोनार्क्स कैप्चर ऑफ कॉन्स्टेंटिनोपल बाय द ऑटोमेंस जील टू स्प्रेड क्रिस्टियनिटी एंड रेनेसा इन यूरोप करेक्ट आंसर इज वन टू थ्री एंड फोर ओनली बी विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग यूरोपियन पावर्स वॉज दॉज द लास्ट टू लीव इंडिया द पोर्चुगीज डी इन द कॉन्टेक्स ऑफ द एडवेंट ऑफ यूरोपियन पावर्स इन इंडिया द टर्म एस्टाडोडा इंडिया कैन बी बेस्ट डिस्क्राइब एज administrative system is of the portuguese in india c arrange the following portuguese governors in correct chronological sequence 1 2 3 213 b 213 almeda albuquerque and kuna number 6 which of the following developments in india can be associated with portuguese presence in india 
propagation of Christianity, yes or no? Yes. Introduction of printing press, yes. Introduction of paper, no. Paper to India ni tha, yahan se lake karke jate the. Answer is A, 1 and 2 only. 7. In context of advent of European powers in India, consider the following statements in the context of the Battle of Bedara. Now, this we are going to cover as part of the Anglo-Bengal War, but the Battle of Bedara was a battle fought between the British and Dutch at a place called Bedara. This is on the Hooghly River, present day Bengal. Mein hai. Now, circumstances kya the? At Mir Jafar, who was fed up with the uh, Clive's perpetual interference in Bengal's administration, had invited the Dutch to house the British from Bengal. Bengal mein British ne Dutch ko hara diya. And finally, following this, the Dutch were forced to sell all their remaining possessions, possessions and factories in India to the British as well. So, statement one, it was a battle fought between the Dutch and British in the Andhra region. Correct or incorrect? Incorrect. Kaha pe? Bengal. Right? The Dutch were defeated in this battle? Correct. So, which of these is correct? B. Two only. The first English factory in India? Masuli Patnam. D. In the context of the seven, of 17th century India, consider the following statements in the context of the Battle of Swali. One, it was fought between English and French. No. Two, it played an important role for English to set up a factory at Surat. Yes. Three, Danes were decisively defeated in this battle. No. Kiske kiske beech mein tha? British and Portuguese. Correct answer? C. Two only. Who among the following was successful in obtaining rights to trade and establish factories in all parts of the Mughal Empire? James the first, Thomas Rowe, William Hawkins or George, Job Charnock? Thomas Rowe, who was he? He was the ambassador of the British monarch, James the first at the court of Jahangir. Ye permission kab obtain kiya isne? 1615 mein, thik hai? Next, we come to the British conquest of India. Firstly, by 1623, that is the first quarter of the 17th century, the East India Company had already established its factories at Surat, Baruch, Agra, Ahmedabad and Masuli Patnam. Initially, it was not strong enough to challenge the authority of the Mughals. However, it was definitely concerned with one thing and what was that? Creating a monopoly over India's overseas trade protecting it from other European companies and obtaining favorable trade terms and conditions from their Indian trading partners. Okay? Come taxes, dene padhe, zyada par factories establish kar le, giving the British permission to raise forces, etc. to defend themselves against European powers, other European powers. These are trade concessions they wanted. Right? Mercantilism became the basis for early British conquest. What is mercantilism? It is an economic philosophy What are the premises of this economic philosophy? First of all, that the wealth of the world is finite or infinite? Finite. Secondly, it perceives economic relations through the perspective of individuals or corporations or nations. Kis perspective se ye wealth ko or economic relations ko perceive karta hai? Nations ko. It believes in the wealth of nations. And with this perspective, economic exchange, what kind of a game is it? It is a 
zero sum game there is always going to be a loser and there is always going to be a winner what is that thing which determines who the loser or the winner is it is the direction of trade and the direction in which drain of wealth occurs now since the various nations had adopted the same philosophy and they perceived economic relations in the same manner is a framework ke through so how did they try to create their dominance economically speaking how did they try to enrich themselves kaise possible hoga nahi by maximizing the profits which are accruing from this trade कैसे बाय ओपनिंग ऑफ द मार्केट और बाय मोनोपलाइजिंग द मार्केट बाय क्रिएटिंग मोनोपलीज सो मर्केंटलिज्म ऑलवेज रेजोनेट्स विद मोनोपली इन द कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ इंडिया इफ द ब्रिटिश आर प्रेजेंट इन इंडिया दे विल ट्राई एंड मोनोपलाइज इंडिया फॉरेन ट्रेड इन दिस सिनारियो since the french are preventing them from doing so the french are going to be the automatic enemies of the british kyunki jitna portion french le ja rahe hain that is seen as something which may have been british profit but that profit is unrealized due to the french presence is this clear and this philosophy became the basis for the early british conquests it resulted in two important wars namely the anglo french or carnatic wars and the anglo bengal wars so the initial phase of british colonialism was brought about due to mercantilism jo later phase of british colonialism hai that is going to be brought about due to industrial capitalism open competition free trade etc theek hai from 1813 onwards डिस्कस किया था ना हमने थ्री फेजेस तो सबसे पहला क्या था मर्केंटाइल कैपिटलिज्म नाउ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वी हैव दी एंग्लो फ्रेंच स्ट्रगल लुकिंग एट दी बैकग्राउंड ऑफ सर्कमस्टांसेस टू और थ्री फैक्टर्स वी कैन आइडेंटिफाई फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल पॉलिटिकल वैक्यूम secondly economic competition thirdly european conditions and fourthly the activities of duple circumstances of the anglo french wars firstly the necessary conditions were created by the prevailing political vacuum in the deccan region secondly mercantilist hostility provided the perpetual tension between the british and french necessary for creating frequent and repetitive wars thirdly the conditions in europe in which the british and french at this point of time were fighting against each other not only for supremacy in europe but for global supremacy also affected the equation between the british and french companies in india and finally the activities of duple the french governor general alarmed the british 
Duple adopted a very prompt and aggressive policy against the British in conjunction with his Indian collaborators. He formed political alliances, political and military alliances. The British were forced to respond. Right. Now, analyzing all these political vacuum, what were the circumstances within which the situation of a political vacuum appeared in the Deccan during the 1740s? Kya hua? First of all, decline of Mughal authority separated the Deccan from Delhi's sphere of influence, giving an opportunity for the European trading companies to uh, assume more and more aggressive positions in this region. This was further complicated by the death of Asaf Jadi first, the founder of the state of Hyderabad, Chin Kilich Khan Nizamul Mulk Khan, he died in 1748, creating succession disputes not only at Hyderabad, but also its client state of Arcut of Karnatik. Okay? So, this was exploited by the British and French companies. They began using this political instability in order to interfere in the political matters of the Deccan region. What was their modus operandi? They wanted to place rulers who were friendly towards them on the throne so that they could extract more and more favorable trade concessions, terms and conditions. But zero sum game tha. So, ek ruler dono ek interest ko fulfill kar sakta tha? Nahi kar sakta tha. And that is why the French bet on one horse and the British on the other. Or dono chavo chalan lag gaye ki hamara ghoda jeet jaye. Right? This was one of the factors behind these wars. Secondly, mercantilist hostility. Now, since mercantilism views world trade as a zero sum game, the interests of the British and French East India companies were diametrically opposed to each other. Right? Secondly, by this point of time, the trade of these countries with India had come to represent sizable portions of their national GDP. In the case of Britain, it uh, represented roughly 10% of their entire GDP. So, could the British have afforded to lose their Indian trade? Nay, but the French were determined to snatch India away from the British. So, ji jaan laga denge Indian interest ko defend karne mein apne. Similar is the case with the French. Although the volume of French trade was only half that of British trade, but we should also remember that French had arrived in India much later than the British. They had arrived not even a hundred years before this entire saga of the wars began, but they had increased the volume of their trade more than 20 times over, over the previous 40 years. So, although it was smaller than British trade, it was aggressively expanding. And Thus, it was increasingly becoming more and more important for the French government to defend its Indian economic positions. Okay? On the <coughs> other, <coughs> sorry, on the other hand, what about the finances of both these companies? Were they highly profitable or were they loss-making enterprises? Loss-making enterprises the. Although trade was profitable, company ko loss ho raha tha. Kyun? Corruption. Okay? The states, both these companies enjoyed monopoly, hai na? but what their uh, company officials were doing was that they were using their presence in India to bypass their own company's monopoly and directly trade between India and Europe. So, what should have been the company's profit was becoming the private profit of the company's employees. So, loss making enterprises, dono. but instead of bringing about internal reforms because it would have involved holding the company's own officials accountable, in ke paas ek excuse tha, kya? That we are making losses because of them, right? Unko khatam kar doge hazur, to kaam ban jayega, we are going to be in the black once again, theek hai? So, this was one of the factors. Thirdly, from the 1740s onwards, 
ब्रिटिश एंड फ्रेंच बिकेम इन्वॉल्व इन ऑलमोस्ट कॉन्स्टेंट वॉरफेयर दो बड़े वॉर्स हुए इन दर्स ऑफ द एंग्लो फ्रेंच वॉर्स एंग्लो फ्रेंच वॉर्स का टाइम पीरियड है फ्रॉम 1745 फोर्टी फाइव टू सेवनटीन सिक्सटी थ्री इन सेवनटीन फोर्टी दॉर ऑफ ऑस्ट्रियन ब्रोक आउट इन यूरोप इन विच ब्रिटिश एंड फ्रेंच वर ऑन अपोजिंग साइड सिमिलरली the seven years war broke out between the british and the french not only in europe but also in america right and yahan par this was used as an excuse by both these companies to settle their own economic and political scores in india and finally the activities of duplay now duplay was the first who envisioned using these european trading companies more sophisticated and advanced militaries as a bargaining chip when negotiating with indian rulers right now yahan pe political instability tha there were several contenders for the throne and all of them wanted to become the next ruler who is going to have the uh, cutting edge jiske paas european company ka support ho right so he began to use their superior french forces in order to extract the promises of favorable trade conditions from possible contenders to the throne theek okay? hai so he had thrown in his lot with a group of rulers could the english sit silently on the side and witness all of this nahi kyunki agar french contender ban jata hai so he is going to simply expel the british that they cannot allow to happen so they were forced to respond so these are the circumstances of the anglo french wars is this clear समझ आया है नाउ दॉर्स डेम सेल्स इस फर्स्ट कर्नाटिक वॉर वॉट वर दर्कमस्टांसेस इट वॉज प्रिसेज बाई दी वॉर ऑफ ऑस्ट्रियन सक्सेशन वॉर ऑफ ऑस्ट्रियन सक्सेशन का टाइम पीरियड है 1745 टू 1748 this was a european war in which britain and france were fighting on opposing sides okay which britain was fighting against france the british east india company used it as an opportunity to provoke a conflict with the french company kyunki unko yahan pe apna monopoly establish karna tha right how in 1745 it confiscated some french ships in the indian ocean okay why did they want to provoke the french because they wanted a war in india also taki status quo resolve sorry jo status quo ho wo break ho and the british would be able to establish their monopoly important events kya hai the french retaliated by capturing madras in 1746 what is the significance of madras it was the headquarters of the bengal presidency it was the primary principal british Uh, settlement on the Coromandel coast at this point of time. The English East India Company appealed to one of its allies, the Nawab of Karnatik, Anwaruddin, to come and rescue it. अब ये Karnatik क्या बोला है? कहाँ पे है? If this is Peninsular India, Hyderabad, ये वाला zone था and Karnatik. was this entire territory theek okay? hai the ruler of hyderabad had his capital in the city of hyderabad and was known by the title nizam theek okay? hai while the ruler of karnatik had his seat of power at arkat and governed with the title of nawab theek okay? hai the ruler of arkat shared the same relationship by this point of time with the ruler of hyderabad as the ruler of hyderabad did with the mughal emperor so mughal emperor ka yahan par nominal sovereignty to tha but did he exercise any real authority no similarly 
the nawab of arcot recognizes the overlordship of the nizam of hyderabad but the nizam of hyderabad did not have any real authority over the ruler of arcot is this much clear to jo nawab of arcot tha kya naam tha iska anwaruddin he was an ally of the british east india company angrezon ko uh, madras se haath dhona pada tha and they appealed to their ally to come and relieve them to lift the french occupation nawab ne kya bola hi ana abhi aake batata hu right to nawab pahunche wahan par he began marching towards madras from his capital at arcot with a contingent of around 10000 soldiers right raste mein ek chhota sa फ्रेंच फोर्ट पड़ा सेंट थॉम दिस इज ऑन द आउटस्कर्ट्स ऑफ मद्रास अलोंग द बैंक्स ऑफ द रिवर अडियार हियर अ स्मॉल फ्रेंच कंपनी ऑफ अबाउट 500 हंड्रेड सोल्जर्स वॉज लाइंग इन वेट फॉर द नवाब आर्मी वॉट वॉज दी जनरल एक्सपेक्टेशन किसकी जीत होनी चाहिए मैथ्स क्या कहता है नवाब शुड स्कोर एन ईजी विक्ट्री बट ऑल दीज एक्सपेक्टेशन वर सबवर्टेड क्या हुआ दी स्मॉल फ्रेंच कंपनी वॉज एबल टू डिफीट द नवाब मच लार्जर ट्रेडिशनल इंडियन आर्मी ठीक है विद दिस हॉस्टिलिटीज सीज इन इंडिया एंड फॉर द रिमाइंडर ऑफ द वॉर Madras remained in the possession of the French. Okay, so at the ground level, who had come out on the upper hand? British or French? French had come out on the upper hand. Who were the biggest losers, however? The Indian powers, not only the Nawab of Karnataka, but all Indian powers. Why? One important thing had been proven. What was that? the military superiority of the british forces of the european forces over the indian forces this uh, engagement had made it clear to all observers that indian powers were no match for the technologically superior even if they were numerically inferior european powers and this is going to give an idea to dalhousie oh, sorry duple kya idea dega रेंट आउट करने के लिए बार्गेनिंग चिप की तरह यूज करने के लिए अपने मिलिट्री को राइट द वॉर एंडेड इन यूरोप विद द ट्रीटी ऑफ एक्स ला शपेल इन 1848 एंड रिजल्ट क्या हुआ इसका ऑल द इंग्लिश पोजिशन इन इंडिया ऑल द इंग्लिश लॉसेज इन इंडिया वर रिस्टोर्ड ठीक है इंक्लूडिंग मद्रास दे वर रिटर्न टू द ब्रिटिश इज दिस क्लियर द रियल सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ द फर्स्ट कर्नाटिक वॉर ले इन द आउटकम ऑफ द बैटल ऑफ सेंट थॉम which proved the military superiority of small but well trained european forces over large indian armies this realization helped shift the balance of power in india towards european companies it demonstrated the overwhelming far reaching influence of sea power and also revealed the state of political decay in india is this clear ye ho gaya the first carnatic war next we have the second carnatic war time period 1749 to 1754 ha ji because in europe they were on the losing side na that is why they had to restore the uh these things ha to dekho unlike the first carnatic war the second carnatic war was not presaged by any european conflict it was born completely out of circumstances in india क्या सर्कमस्टांसेस थे वॉर ऑफ सक्सेशन एट बोथ 
हैदराबाद एंड आरकट ठीक है इन हैदराबाद वन ऑफ दी सन्स ऑफ निजामुल मुल्क नासिर जंग एड चैलेंज द राइट ऑफ हिज नेफ्यू मुजफ्फर जंग टू रूल सिमिलरली एट आरकट द रूल ऑफ चंदा साहेब the rule of uh, muhammad ali was challenged by chanda sahib and thus this was a perfect opportunity for dalhousie to sorry for duple to intervene <coughs> duple entered an alliance with muzaffar jang in hyderabad and chanda saheb in arcot and the british responded by founding a counter alliance with nasir jang at hyderabad and mohammad ali at arcot clear hai itna now initially the french succeeded in placing both muzaffar jang as well as chanda saheb on the throne now this was a big loss for the british could the british afford this kind of loss because ultimately once the hostilities ceased kya hoga muzaffar jang and chanda saheb are simply going to expel the british from their territories this would have been a major loss wo tolerate nahi kar sakte the and that is why a strong army was sent all the way from bengal under the leadership of robert clive to attack the french position at arcot the most significant engagement of this war was the siege of arcot in 1751 kya hua yahan par chanda saheb the french nominee was defeated and killed and mohammad ali the british nominee was placed on the throne of arcot is this clear the war however continued for three more years after which it ended with the treaty of pondicherry to ye keval india mein war hua hai to treaty bhi india mein hi hoga treaty of pondicherry with this treaty mohammad ali was recognized as the nawab of karnataka by both the british and the french what is the significance of this war this was a major step forward for the british at the end of the first karnataka war they had emerged as the junior european power in south india with this they had raised reached equality with the french power in the south the war gave british a stronghold over the karnatak which was a setback for the french company theek hai the french government also reacted negatively to this news kya kiya inhone the governor general duple was recalled to france due to the financial losses suffered in the expensive wars and this in fact was the biggest blow to any future french hopes in india why because it was duple who was the mastermind of french imperialism and expansion in india from this blow the french are never going to be able to recover itna clear hai and then we have the third carnatic war once again the background is going to be provided by a european conflict kaun sa conflict the seven years war this war was fought simultaneously in europe america as well as india important developments kya the in place of duple the french had sent count dilali however he did not have the military or political acumen of duple kai sari isne significant strategic mistakes kari for example he 
he recalled his most uh, capable general from the deccan that is debussy and uh, in one stroke he ended the french influence in hyderabad right so hyderabad was now open for the taking for the british without french support salabat jung the new nizam turned towards the english for help right so with this both carnatic as well as hyderabad came under the control of the british french stronghold such as chandranagar masuli patnam and yenem all fell one by one to british incursions and the most significant battle was that of the wandi wash kab hua ye 1760 where the forces of dilali were defeated by sir ayer coot theek hai wandi wash is a place in tamil nadu on the outskirts of pondicherry right after this pondicherry also fell what was the importance of pondicherry it was the french headquarters in india so in real terms with the battle of wandi wash actual fighting in india came to an end but no peace treaty was signed why because seven years war was still going on and finally after the war ended the war in india also officially came to an end with the peace of paris the treaty of paris in 1763 following the end of the seven years war what were the provisions of this treaty first of all chandranagar and pondicherry these were french factory settlements were returned to the french but they could no longer be fortified so french were not allowed to build any further fortifications pondicherry near tamil nadu and chandranagar in bengal secondly the french were allowed to retain trading posts in india but they would be governed by an english resident from now onward therefore a british resident would be in charge of administering the french trading settlements in india theek hai so any real french authority remains nahi and thirdly the french government agreed to support the british client governments in india that means the french government agreed that it is not going to make any policies or take any actions against the allies and subordinate partners of the british company in india theek hai so with this the french power in india and french ambitions in india received their final blow one more significance of this war is that it led to an immense and rapid troop build up in india the british brought as many as 67000 fighting men from england to india and in the future the british indian army is going to become the chief medium not only of its political expansion but also in opening up new regions for trade theek okay? hai so these are the significances of the third carnatic war and finally the reasons for the french failure or british success batao many of these are going to be similar to the ones we had already discussed in the context of the failure of the portuguese kya kya hai the basic nature of the british and french east india companies was different the english east india company was a private joint stock trading company whereas the french east india company was a public sector undertaking it was a state sponsored company so the english east india company enjoyed all the strengths of all private joint stock trading companies and the french east india company suffered from all the weaknesses associated with it that we have already discussed और क्या फैक्टर्स हो सकते हैं वेरी गुड ब्रिटिश नेवल सुपीरियोरिटी गिव इट एन आर्डेड एडवांटेज ओवर द फ्रेंच मेजर एंगेजमेंट्स 
and logistics were determined by naval superiority where english always had an upper hand what else theek hai the conquest of bengal following the battle of plassey allowed the english east india company to use the resources of bengal in order to overcome the french what else superior personnel theek hai so the english economy or english society was an open and meritocratic one uh, it was more democratic the french system was more feudalistic where uh, prestige sorry privilege was the norm of social and economic organization therefore the english were able to promote or receive the services of the most capable officers and generals while the french were not aur kya parliamentary government was more stable acha theek hai तो मोनार्किकल गवर्नमेंट में क्या प्रॉब्लम था बिकॉज एट दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम तो कोई देर वॉज नो इंटरने सॉरी ठीक है तो द इंग्लिश constitutional monarchy versus the french absolute monarchy so the british were able to take advantage of the national energies brought about by their political transformation while the french were deprived from it what else yes kisi mein aa jayega wo yahan pe aa jayega corruption wo yahan pe aa jayega yahan pe aa jayega हाँ? वो भी यहां पे आ जाएगा राइट व्हाट एल्स अरे व्हाट वर दी इंपॉर्टेंट ब्रिटिश एंड फ्रेंच सेटलमेंट्स इन इंडिया व्हाट वर देयर स्ट्रेटेजिक पोर्ट्स फ्रेंच के क्या नाम याद आते हैं आपको पॉन्डिचेरी और मद्रास कहा चंदरनगर और यनम कारिकाल वर एनी ऑफ देम इंपॉर्टेंट ट्रेड और नेवल सेंटर्स नो In contrast, British had Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. So, a very famous historian, Vincent Smith, made an observation: If he had not called Alexander the Great, then he would not have been able to overcome a power which controlled uh, Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta from the bases of Pondicherry or Chandernagar. Okay? So, the British enjoyed geographic or strategic advantages as well right this is the set of reasons for the french failure and the british success next we have the anglo bengal war the two important battles plassey and secondly बक्सर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द बैटल ऑफ लासी
बैकग्राउंड और सर्कमस्टांसेस और फैक्टर्स बिहाइंड दी बैटल ऑफ प्लासी बताओ जी टू सेट्स ऑफ फैक्टर्स वर रिस्पॉन्सिबल नंबर वन the immediate factor and secondly the long term irritant in the anglo bengal relationship what was the immediate trigger the construction of additional fortifications at calcutta by the company officials without uh, obtaining permission from the nawab this was a period when british and french hostility in india was peaking now both the british and french were strengthening themselves and girding their loins so to speak against the possible future invasions or attacks from their enemies from their european enemies lekin dono ne hi nawab se permission obtain nahi kiya tha i told you na that fortification was a sovereign function of the nawab iske liye permission obtain karna important tha so that is why the nawab sent very angry letters warning both the british and the french to destroy the additional fortification french agreed they destroyed it so nawab did not act against them अंग्रेजों ने क्या बोला बोलने दो नवाब को जो बोलता है हमें फर्क नहीं पड़ता राइट तो नवाब ने क्या किया ही इन्वेडेड ही अटैक दी कंपनी पोजीशन एट कैलकटा ही इम्प्रिजन अ नंबर ऑफ कंपनी ऑफिशियल्स एंड फोर्स अ नंबर ऑफ अदर्स टू प्ले क्लियर है इतना ये तो था इमीडिएट ट्रिगर दिस प्रोवोक दी अर रिस्पॉन्स फ्रॉम दी ब्रिटिश हाउ एवर देर हैड बीन अ long term irritant which had brought the relationship between english and bengal to the breaking point and what was this the misuse of dastaks what were these dastaks this was a piece of paper which allowed the company to avoid paying any customs taxes on its external trade throughout the territory of bengal bengal at that point of time was the undivided portion of west and west bengal and bangladesh plus undivided bihar plus odisha theek hai to ye pura ka pura area mein yahan se koi bhi external trade agar company kar raha hai whether it is importing anything or exporting anything would not have to pay any taxes what was the basis for this dastak dastak ye dastak issue kon karta tha the calcutta council of the east india company had the power to issue these dastak right it used to give these dastaks to its agents to its officials who were ferrying goods in and out of bengal theek hai what was the basis on which the company had this power to issue these dastak ek farman issue kiya tha farman meaning a royal decree or order had been obtained by the english east india company from the mughal emperor farooq siyar in 1717 which permitted them to conduct duty free trade in the entire territory of bengal theek hai to kyon itna meherban hua tha farooq siyar what is this story ha to the idea is ki farooq siyar bimar rehta tha kamzor aadmi tha right and ek angrezon ka doctor calcutta se pahuncha wahan pe somebody called william hamilton he was able to treat him to khush ho kar ke ek jam piya और साइन लगा दिया राइट right? कि क्या चाहिए हुजूर ये चाहिए उन्होंने तो साइन कर दिया राइट एंड फ्रॉम देन द कंपनी हैड बीन एबल टू कंडक्ट ड्यूटी फ्री ट्रेड अक्रॉस द टेरिटरी ऑफ बंगाल 
अब ये तो आइडिया हो गया कि दस्तक था क्या हाउ वॉज इट बींग मिस यूज हाँ दीज दस्तक वर ओनली मेंट टू एग्जेम ट्रेड ऑफ द कंपनी राइट नॉट ऑफ द कंपनीज ऑफिशियल्स तो कंपनी के ऑफिशियल्स एक तो खुद परफॉर्म कर रहे थे ट्रेड बिटवीन इंडिया एंड यूरोप राइट तो दे वर ऑल्सो परचेजिंग गुड्स फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड सेंडिंग देम टू यूरोप थ्रू देयर डच एजेंट्स सेकेंडली देर वर सम इंडियन मर्चेंट थ्रू वर ऑल्सो बींग सोल्ड दीज दस्तक बाई कंपनी ऑफिशियल फॉर अ फी तो करप्शन हो रहा था बहुत ज्यादा एंड हु वॉज द अल्टीमेट लूजर इन ऑल ऑफ दिस द ट्रेजरी ऑफ बेंगाल राइट सो ऑल द नवाब ऑफ बेंगाल इंक्लूडिंग द फर्स्ट नवाब मुर्शिद कुली खान एंड द सेकेंड वन अली वर्दी खान हैड रेज दिस इश्यू ऑफ मिस यूज ऑफ दस्तक बट द कंपनी हैड सिंपली इग्नोर्ड ऑल दीज थिंग्स फाइनली सिराज उद्दौला वॉज नो लॉन्गर रेडी टू टॉलरेट ऑल ऑफ दिस ठीक है ना The ball was set rolling when Siraj ud Dola in the summer of 1756 attacked the company's position at Calcutta, leading to something known as the Black Hole tragedy. अब वो हुआ या नहीं हुआ, that we cannot say for sure. But public opinion in Britain and also among the British officials in India was raised in favour of unseating the Nawab on the basis of this narrative of the Black Hole tragedy. पता है ना क्या ये narrative? हाँ दैट सेवरल हाँ सेवरल ब्रिटिश रेजिडेंट्स वर कन्फाइंड इन टू अ स्मॉल स्पेस एंड दे डाइड इन दी स्टफी कंडीशन राइट हाँ क्या नो नो इंडियन सोर्सेज वैलिडेट दिस इनफैक्ट ये एक इंग्लिश न्यूज पेपर मैन था जेम्स हॉलवेल He had related this story when he went back to England, right? So, वहाँ पे newspaper में एक बड़ा sensation बना था. And this is what had uh, suddenly changed the public perception uh, in Britain towards Robert Clive, because by this point of time वो news आ चुका था कि Clive has become the new Nawab. तो पहले तो बहुत uh, uh, criticism हुआ, but then it was justified with this. कोई Indian source ऐसा नहीं है जो इसको justify important events attack on calcutta by siraj ud daula in order to respond to this madras se clive ko कंपनी ने भेजा टू बेंगाल लाइव वॉज सेंट टू बेंगाल टू नेगोशिएट फ्रेश ट्रीटी एंड इन फेब्ररी 1757 फिफ्टी सेवन नवाब एंड क्लाइव Signed the Treaty of Alipur. It appeared as if the situation has been resolved. The company was allowed to return to Calcutta, rebuild its fortifications. सब कुछ की permission मिल गई. Many of the company's privileges and officials were also restored. However, Clive was not negotiating in good faith. He was simultaneously conspired against the Nawab with some important Bengali nobles, officials, and personalities. चार लोगों के नाम इसमें इंपॉर्टेंट हैं कौन है शरीफ लोग मीर जाफर हु वॉज ही दी बख्शी दैट इज द कमांडर इन चीफ ऑफ द नवाब आर्मी 
और जगत सेठ हु वॉज ही ही वॉज दी ऑफिशियल बैंकर एंड ऑल्सो अ प्रोमिनेंट बैंकर ऑफ बेंगाल अनदर वन अमी चंद और ओमी चंद ही वॉज अ प्रोमिनेंट ऑफिशियल एंड अ लीडिंग मर्चेंट ऑफ बेंगाल एंड फाइनली घसीटी बेगम कौन है ये चाची चार सौ बीस राइट ही वॉज एन आंट ऑफ द नवाब हु वॉन्टेड टू सी हर ओन सन प्लेस ऑन दी थ्रोन एंड देन क्लाइव हु हैड अश्योर द नवाब दैट फ्रॉम नाउ ऑन द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ मिस यूज ऑफ दस्तक्स इज नो लॉन्गर गोइंग टू फैक्टर he reneged on the treaty he encouraged his officials to start once again engaging in corrupt activities live reneged on the treaty of alipur and the consequence was a battle कहां पे लासी बट दिस वॉज नॉट अ बैटल इन दी ट्रू सेंस इट वॉज राधर अ ग्रेट बिट्रेल क्यों मीर जाफर हु वॉज इन कमांड ऑफ द आर्मी नेवर गेव द ऑर्डर फॉर द सोल्जर्स टू एडवांस there was a small company of soldiers who was personally fighting under the command of the nawab who fought but the bulk of the bengal army did not engage the british they simply spectated the massacre of the loyal soldiers taking place on the battlefield iske baad kya hota hai mir jafar goes up to the nawab and advises him he you should retreat back to the palace by this point of time the writing was clear on the wall for surajuddola कि अब मेरे मैं बचने नहीं वाला हूं सो ही डिसाइडेड टू रन अवे ही वॉज ट्राइंग टू एस्केप टू फाइंड मोर एलाइज टू रेज अ फ्रेश आर्मी बट ही वॉज कॉट एंड एग्जीक्यूटेड बाई वन ऑफ द सन्स ऑफ मीर जाफर ठीक है फॉलोइंग दिस हु वॉज नेम्ड एज द न्यू नवाब मीर जाफर बिकेम दी nawab and in return for his services how did he for their services how did he reward the company and its officials he made huge cash rewards to clive and other senior company officials and also transferred the zamindari of 24 pargana to the east india company and this transfer of indian wealth to the british has been regarded by dada bhai naro ji as the first instance of drain of wealth theek okay? hai what is the significance of the battle of plassey batao ji the company emerged as a major political player and its victory in the battle of plassey represented the first step towards british empire building
the company was able to use its advantageous position in bengal to overcome its staunch rival the french in the south so victory in bengal also ensured victory in the deccan fourthly the british were no longer compelled to bring bullion from britain in order to purchase finished indian products rather they began ploughing the revenue of bengal back into british commerce so the import of british bullion ceased and the british began draining bengal's wealth company officials because of their corrupt influence over administration also began direct plunder by extorting money from indian zamindars peasants artisans merchants everybody further because of paucity of funds needed to organize administration the general level of governance in bengal suffered and with the failure of the state misery was experienced in bengal at an unprecedented level due to mismanagement and over exploitation the saga of british induced famines emerged as an unaltered reality of british rule in india theek okay? hai so ye sari changes ab introduce honge these are the significances of the battle of plat clear next we have the battle of baksar what were the circumstances behind this the mir jafar very quickly came to the realization that he will not be able to govern bengal in the which, way in which he always imagined he had not anticipated that uh, clive is going to get involved intimately in the matter of administration but he did mir jafar resented his powerlessness and the constant british interference and therefore he was looking for a way out kahan pe usko ummeed ki kiran dikhi dutch he entered into negotiations with the dutch to come and displace the british from india result kya tha battle of bidara also known as the battle of chinsura resulting in whose defeat dutch defeat right are the british going to allow mir jafar to remain in power no so mir jafar ko ab replace kiya jayega kisse his own son in law mir kasim uh, when mir kasim came to power he did many of the same things that mir jafar had done kya kya karega ye cash rewards to senior company officials and some territorial assignments to the company he is going to transfer three important regions of bengal to company's ownership kon kon se bmc kya hai ye burdwan midnapur and chittagong right he gave 
East India Company the territories of Burdwan, Midnapur and Chittagong. He also made huge cash rewards to the company's top officials. However, he also realized that he is simply a powerless rubber stamp under the thumb of Robert Clive. Further, he was going, growing increasingly distressed by the unceasing practice of the misuse of Dastak. So, he also raised the same issue of misuse of Dastak, right? But the company was not going to be able to do this. He became increasingly frustrated and ultimately, as an act of desperation, what did he do? He abolished all taxes on external trade. Okay? So, this removed the competitive advantage that the British company and its officials enjoyed with respect to other traders involved in foreign trade in Bengal. Okay? Now, this angered the British and its officials. They wanted to remove Mir Qasim once again and replace him with Mir Jafar. But before this could be done, what did Mir, Jaf Mir Qasim do? Murshidabad chhod karke bhaag gaya, right? Isne bola milunga hi nahi toh hata hoge kaise, right? He transferred his capital from Murshidabad to Munger and from Munger he began preparing for war. He entered into an alliance with two other important powers. Kaun kaun? The Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II and the Nawab of Awadh, Shuja Uddala. He also began making preparation for war by establishing a gun factory at Munger, ठीक है? So, gunpowder and gun factory Munger में उसने बनाया. This created the occasion for the Battle of Baksar in 1764. The Indian alliance consisting of these three powers led by their monarchs fought against the British led by Hector Munro. ठीक है? Robert Clive यहाँ पे नहीं था. He had returned back to England by this point of time. So, by Hector Munro. कौन जीता? कौन हारा? The British won. And the Indians were defeated. Okay? Now, unlike the Battle of Lassi, the Battle of Baksar cannot be called a great betrayal. Why? There was no betrayal or conspiracy of any kind. Both sides were committed to their cause, to the cause of their victory from the beginning to the end. And the fortunes on the battlefield kept on shifting continuously. So, here match fixing was not done before, I didn't know who will win and who will win. Clear? Okay. Consequences were the consequences? First of all, Mir Jafar will be cut. Right? He is going to be removed from the, sorry, Mir Qasim will be cut. He is going to be removed from the position of Nawab and replaced by Mir Jafar. And secondly, the company now also concluded two separate treaties with, firstly, the Mughal Emperor and secondly, the Nawab of Awadh. Ye dono treaties kaha pe sign hui? At Allahabad in 1765. They are known as the treaties of Allahabad. Treaty number one with the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II. What are the important provisions? Shah Alam II agreed to transfer the Diwani rights of Bengal to the company. Thik hai? Diwani rights kya hote hain? I had told you na that Murshid Kuli Khan had become the Nawab of Bengal by joining the Nizamat and Diwani functions. The powers of general administration with financial, financial functions, right? So, financial functions ko bolte hain Diwani rights. That means the right to collect revenue and uh, plan for uh, uh, expenditure, theek hai? So, income or expenditure ka power company ko isne transfer kar diya. Why is this significant? Because at least theoretically speaking, the company now became a legal shareholder in the governance hierarchy. It became a legal ruler of Bengal. It was owning one of the sovereign functions of the state. So, simply company se ab kya ban gaya? Company Bahadur ban gaya. Clear hai? Secondly, a provision was made for the division of the revenues of Bengal. This uh, treaty was signed in 1764. In 1764, roughly 4 crore rupees were collected as taxes from the entire province. Out of these, rupees 53 lakhs were to be given to the Nawab of Bengal. What will the Nawab use for this? Nawab? Ash karne ke liye? Nahi, administration, defense, sab kuch ke liye, Nawab is going to use all of this. 26 lakhs would be given to the 
Mughal emperor every year and what is going to happen to the rest? Roughly 3.2 crores. All of that is going to be kept by the company. Okay, company because it is collecting itself or theoretically collecting it. It is going to give all this money or this money is going to be distributed to the Nawab and the Mughal emperor by the company. Thirdly, from now on, the Mughal emperor will have to reside in Allahabad under the protection of the company. Okay? What does it mean under the protection of the company? It is a polite way of saying that आज से तुम हमारे कैदी हो, ठीक है? So he became a virtual prisoner of the East India Company. Is this clear? Second treaty imposed by the British on Sujaudola the Nawab of Awadh. क्या क्या अग्री किया इसने कि अग्रीड टू पे वॉर इंडेमिटी ऑफ वन क्रोर रुपीज एक बार दिस इज नॉट एनुअली ठीक है सेकेंडली ही अग्रीड टू ट्रांसफर दिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ अलाहाबाद एंड कारा टू दी मुगल एम्पर मुगल एम्पर वॉज टू रिजाइड एट अलाहाबाद इन परपेचुटी अंडर द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ द कंपनी इफ मुगल एम्पर इज अंडर द कंट्रोल ऑफ द कंपनी तो अलाहाबाद एंड कारा ऑटोमेटिकली उसके कंट्रोल में है ठीक है थर्डली दी जमींदारी ऑफ बनारस वॉज गिवेन टू Balwant Rai. Balwant Rai was one of the allies of the company in order to reward this. ये किया था. And fourthly, the company promised to support the Nawab against outside attacks, provided he paid for the company's troops. So the first steps towards forming a subsidiary alliance with Awad are being taken by this treaty. Is this clear? Sure. What is the significance of this treaty? The Mughal emperor, who was the nominal sovereign of India, Became a prisoner of the company. Avad, because of its military alliance with the company, now emerged as a buffer state. What was the most valuable British possession in India? The province of Bengal. Who was the biggest threat? Marathas. So, in this, now in the middle, Avad will come. It would act as a cushion between Marathas and Bengal and absorb all the Maratha invasions. With the Treaty of Allahabad, the company had become the de jure ruler. That means legal ruler of Bengal, and it also allowed the East India Company to introduce dual government in Bengal. Is this clear? So, अभी बिना देखे बताओ what were the provisions of the two treaties of Allahabad? पहला वाला one with the Mughal emperor. क्या क्या हैं? Diwani rights of Bengal were given to company. There was provision for division of revenues or Mughal emperor would stay at Allahabad under the company's protection. ठीक है? Treaty with the Nawab of Awadh क्या क्या हैं? War indemnity of one crore rupees, transfer of Allahabad and Kara, restoration of the zamindari rights of Balwant Rai, and the first steps towards a subsidiary alliance, a military alliance with the East India Company. ठीक है? तो ये है provisions significance kya hai the company had overcome not one but three major important powers of india it had established its control over the mughal emperor mughal emperor emerged as a client of the company the company was also able to cloak itself in legality by obtaining the diwani rights of bengal the company was also in a position to introduce the diwani sorry the dual government of bengal and it was able to erect avad as a buffer between itself and maratha power to the west okay now we come to the dual government of bengal kya hai ye dual government of bengal it is the administrative arrangement which emerged in bengal following the treaty of allahabad following the battle of baksar who had introduced it robert clive was the मास्टर दी इट वॉज द ब्रेन चाइल्ड ऑफ रॉबर्ट क्लाइव क्या टाइम पीरियड था इसका फंडामेंटली इट इन्वॉल्व द सेपरेशन ऑफ एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी From power, okay. 
with the division of the sovereign functions of the state of bengal into two units namely the nizamat functions and the diwani functions under the control of two notionally independent bodies namely the nawab and the company in such a manner where in reality the nawab is going to be perpetually dependent upon the company in order to fulfill his administrative responsibility that is known as dual government theek hai dual kyun kyunki yahan pe do rulers hain is this clear acha now who had the theoretical responsibility of revenue functions company did the company have any experience of revenue collection or administration nahi was it actually interested in getting intimately involved in this nahi fayda nahi hai kyunki usme bahut zyada kharcha karna padega training dena padega kai sare officials ko deploy karna hoga so it is better to co-opt the revenue machinery which was already in existence and thus the company because it corruptly controlled the nawab got the nawab to appoint two deputy diwans aapke notes mein inke naam bhi mentioned hai kon kon mohammad reza khan and raja shitab rai right who are going to work on behalf of the company so they are going to do the administrative work that the company is actually going to do they are going to collect revenue from the people of bengal who are they going to submit this revenue to to the nawab or to the company to the company now although they have been appointed by the nawab are they actually responsible accountable to the nawab no they can be removed at any time by the company officials because they are representatives of the company when it comes to the diwani functions they bear responsibility to the east india company and how did the company start misusing this arrangement kaise dekho ha the company was actually supposed to collect only 4 crore rupees per year is it going to stop at only 4 crore rupees no it is going to pressurize the deputy diwans to collect much more and give all of it to the east india company secondly only a fraction of the uh, entire revenue of bengal was to be set aside for the critical purpose of administration so what is going to happen to administration it is going to collapse thirdly the company through its revenue officials is also going to start terrorizing and exploiting the ordinary bengalis such as zamindars merchants traders uh, even artisans and peasants what is going to be the result of all this immense suffering and major famine namely the great bengal famine of 1770 right it was in this scenario when the famine was at its peak that warren hastings arrived as the new governor of bengal and immediately what did he do he abolished the dual government of bengal clear so ye ho gaya system of dual government and following this a major change came in the form of the regulating act of 1773 why is this significant because it was the first attempt of the british parliament or government to interfere in the company's activities in india as the name suggests it was meant to regulate the company's activities in india theek okay. hai what were the circumstances behind this 
टू फोल्ड सर्कमस्टांसिस थे फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल द चेंजिंग नेचर ऑफ द ब्रिटिश इकोनॉमी वॉज क्रिएटिंग अ नंबर ऑफ बिजनेस प्रेशर्स विच वर हैविंग देयर इफेक्ट इन इंडियन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑल्सो एंड सेकेंड इशू क्या था द चेंजिंग पब्लिक परसेप्शन टूवर्ड्स द कंपनी एंड इट्स ऑफिशियल्स दे वर बींग सीन मोर एंड मोर एज करप्ट ठीक है अच्छा मेजर चेंज क्या हुआ था ब्रिटिश इकोनॉमी में द बिगनिंग ऑफ द इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन राइट ना हियर बिकॉज ऑफ दिस अ न्यू क्लास ऑफ वेरी इंफ्लुएंशियल इंडिविजुअल्स इज गोइंग टू इमर्ज इन ब्रिटेन कौन द कैपिटलिस्ट राइट अब कैपिटलिस्ट आर दे गोइंग टू बी इन फेवर ऑफ द कंटिन्यूएशन ऑफ द कंपनी मोनोपली और विल दे वॉन्ट द कंपनी मोनोपली टू एंड एंड क्यों कंपनी बाई Establishing its monopoly is acting as a middleman between India and Britain. The capitalists want direct access to Indian market, and they want to purchase Indian goods as cheaply as possible. Company middleman ban ke usme apna commission maximize kar raha hai. They want the company's influence to be eradicated. Okay, and thus with this, voices within the parliamentary democratic system of Britain also started to act against. कंपनी एक मूवमेंट इमर्ज हुआ नोन एज दी फ्री ट्रेड मूवमेंट इट इमर्ज इन दी सेवेंटीन सिक्सटीज इट सेल्फ विद द इमर्जेंस ऑफ द विद द बिगनिंग ऑफ द इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन बट एज द इंडस्ट्रियल रेवल्यूशन एक्सलरेटेड मोर एंड मोर इट बिकेम बिगर एंड बिगर फ्री ट्रेड मूवमेंट इज गोइंग टू बिकम स्ट्रॉगर एंड स्ट्रॉगर एंड विद द पैसेज ऑफ टाइम यू विल फाइंड the erosion of the company's monopoly right and its uh, discretion in india you will find increasing government oversight and control till ultimately in 1858 company ka role hi khatam kar diya jayega and direct british rule is going to be instituted theek okay? hai so one major change was this the industrial revolution second was the changing public perception with regards to the company in india what had the company been established as as a trading company what was its purpose to maximize profits for its shareholders but what had it gotten itself involved in wars ruling right it had emerged as a political power now this should all have resulted in maximization of profits but reality mein kya ho raha tha the company was on the verge of bankruptcy right so people were extremely curious and because of the big money interest by uh, of the capitalist isko publicity bhi bahut zyada mil rahi thi is issue ko right and new narratives were woven around the company's officials so english newspapers mein satires bante the cartoons bante the right aur wahan pe company ke corrupt officials ko kis tarah se dikhaya jata tha as nawabs themselves the british came up coined a new term नवाब जहां पे कार्टून में कंपनी ऑफिशियल्स को दिखाया जाएगा कि पालकी में बैठ के जा रहे हैं पान चबाते हुए इधर थूक रहे हैं उधर थूक रहे हैं दे आर लिविंग अ लाइफ ऑफ लग्जरी हाथी के ऊपर बैठ के जा रहे हैं वाइल द कॉमन इंग्लिश पर्सन इज शोन इन कॉन्ट्रास्ट वो uh, रात दिन काम करके थोड़े बहुत चंद पैसे लेके आ रहा है एंड दे आर बींग टैक्स द कॉमन इंग्लिश मैन इज बींग टैक्स बाई द ब्रिटिश राइट तो पब्लिक परसेप्शन स्टार्टेड टू शिफ्ट and because britain was increasingly becoming more and more democratic public perception was becoming increasingly more and more important relevant theek hai therefore the parliament had to respond when the company applied for a loan from the government unhone bola ki ha chalo loan to de denge we are going to save your skins but loan ke sath you will have to also accept certain conditions and as part of those conditions ye jo regulating act of 1773 hai that was enacted ठीक है वॉट आर दी प्रोविजन ऑफ दिस रेगुलेटिंग एक्ट क्या कहें द गवर्नर ऑफ बेंगाल वुड फ्रॉम हेंस फोर्थ बी कॉल्ड द गवर्नर जनरल ऑफ बेंगाल विथ सुपरवाइजिंग पावर्स ओवर द अदर प्रेसिडेंसी ही इज नॉट गोइंग टू गवर्न ऑन हिज ओन यूनिलैटरल गवर्नेंस नहीं होगा राधर he is going to act in council along with the governor general there is going to be a council of four other members the act also nominated the four initial members lekin wo baad mein badle bhi gaye theek hai 
these were Bearwell, Francis, Monson and Clavering. What was the basis on which they functioned? Majority voting ke principle pe function karte the, right? The governors of Madras and Bombay presidencies were made subordinate to the governor general of Bengal. The act also provided for the establishment of a supreme court at Calcutta, which was later established in 1774, the next year. First chief justice of the supreme court, Sir Elijah Impe. But there were certain doubts regarding the just, uh, jurisdiction of this particular court. They were resolved through the amending act of 1781. Kya decide kya that it would not have jurisdiction across the territory of British India, rather its jurisdiction would be limited to the city limits of Calcutta and it would extend only upon the British or Europeans living in India. Okay? The amending act fixed the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to the city limits of Calcutta and to Europeans only. And lastly, East India Company officials were prohibited from taking bribes or gifts. Okay? What is the significance of the Regulating Act of 1773? It was the first attempt by the British Parliament to intervene in the company's activities in India. It announced the beginning of the free trade movement and was the first in a series of steps which the British parliament and government would take over the next half century and more to completely erode the company's monopoly and even the company's rule in India. It was the first of many steps to end the company's monopoly and rule in India. It also provided the basis for India's future administrative centralization and political unification. How? by bringing Bengal, sorry, by bringing Bombay and Madras under the subordination of the presidency of Bengal. Fifthly, it was the first instance where the British government and British parliament became directly involved with the governance of India even if it was in an indirect manner.
and with its creation of the supreme court of calcutta it represented the first instance of the introduction of british extra territoriality as well as the anglical system of jurisprudence on indian land for the first time extra territoriality kya hota hai that certain sections of people are not going to be subjected to the ordinary land uh, law of the land this was specially true in the case of colonialism so british for example in india especially under british rule were judged according to british laws theek hai isko bolte hain extra territoriality and the introduction of these british laws in india later is going to become the basis for the anglicization of the entire judicial machinery and the legal system so it was the beginning of extra territoriality and introduction of uh, the anglical system of jurisprudence by prohibiting company officials from accepting gifts or bribes the foundational values of the future civil service in india were also laid by this act ठीक है आ, ये तो सब पॉजिटिव पॉजिटिव चीजें हैं कुछ लिमिटेशन भी थे या नहीं बताओ अरे कुछ सोच सकते हो क्या लिमिटेशन रहे होंगे अरे देखो एक तो प्रॉब्लम था विद दी सिस्टम ऑफ मेजोरिटी वोटिंग इट इज गोइंग टू क्रिएट अ लॉट ऑफ फ्रिक्शन लेटर ऑन ठीक है Lord system of majority voting leading to friction and policy paralysis. कैसे For any resolution to be passed in the council, the governor general would require the support of at least two more काउंसिलर्स right? लेकिन एक situation emerge हुआ that a group emerge हो गया within the काउंसिलर्स of three against the governor general. तो so, governor general कोई भी resolution introduce करता था Three of them would group together to defeat it. That is why it had to be rectified in the Fitz India Act of 1784. Okay, so वहाँ पे जो executive council का strength है, that was reduced from four to three. Therefore, now the governor general would require the support of only one more councillor, and he was also given the casting vote in order to break the tie. Secondly, the administrative centralization or increasing control of the british parliament and government over the companies officials in india they were quite limited in nature why because of practical limitations of 18th century transport and communications theek hai to bangal se agar bombay koi order bhejna hota 
या फिर कोई रिस्पॉन्स एलिसिट करना होता तो इट वुड टेक द बेटर पार्ट ऑफ थ्री मंथ राइट तो इज द गवर्नर जनरल ऑफ बंगाल गोइंग टू मेंटेन एनी इफेक्टिव ओवरसाइट ओवर द गवर्नर ऑफ बॉम्बे और मद्रास नहीं हो सकता सेम इज गोइंग टू बी द केस बिटवीन इंडिया एंड द कंपनीज ऑफिशियल बैक होम और क्या लिमिटेशन बताइए वॉट एल्स अरे ऑल दो इट हैड मेड अ स्टेप अगेंस्ट द कंपनीज मोनोपली इट हैड नॉट टेकन एनी कॉन्क्रीट स्टेप टू इराडिकेट द मोनोपली एट ऑल इनफैक्ट द रेगुलेटिंग एक्ट ऑफ सेवनटीन सेवेंटी थ्री हैड कन्फर्म्ड द मोनोपलिस मोनोपलिस्टिक राइट ऑफ द कंपनी and from now on in succeeding charter acts the company's monopoly is going to be automatically resolved every 20 years or so theek okay? hai so it had perpetuated the company's monopoly also these were the limitations associated with this act they deprived indians of the liberal laws of england so angrez aisa bole to acha lagta hai <laughs> hum log nahi bolenge हाँ तो आप ये बोल सकते हो दैट इंग्लिश यूर स्टूडेंट्स विच वॉज एट द कटिंग एज ऑफ द मॉडर्न इंटेलेक्चुअल मूवमेंट मे हैव बेनिफिटेड इंडियंस बट द ब्रिटिश शोज नॉट टू इंट्रोड्यूस इट ऑल ओवर इंडिया बट आई डोंट नो कि वो कितना वैलिड होगा आर्ग्यूमेंट ठीक है तो दीज वर दिमिटेश नाउ सर्टन क्वेश्चन Rise of British supremacy in India. Some questions: Who among the following was the first European to initiate the policy of taking part in the quarrels of Indian princes with a view to acquire territory? <coughs> Do play B. Which of the following pairs is correctly matched? Battle of Buxar, Jaffer versus Clive. Battle of Wandiwash, French versus East India Company. Battle of Chilean Wala, Dalhousie versus Marathas. Battle of Khardha, Nizam versus East India Company. B. वॉन्डी वॉश फ्रेंच वर्सेज ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी बैटल ऑफ बक्सर में कौन कौन थे थ्री इंडियन पावर्स अगेंस्ट क्लाइव सॉरी अगेंस्ट दी यूरोपियन पावर अगेंस्ट दी ब्रिटिश राइट बैटल ऑफ चिलियन वाला सेकेंड एंग्लो सेकेंड एंग्लो सीख वॉर का एक बैटल था राइट इट वॉज डल हाउजी अगेंस्ट दी सीख्स एंड बैटल ऑफ खरदा फॉर्ट इन सेवनटीन नाइनटी फाइव वॉज अ मेजर बैटल बिटवीन द निजाम एंड दी मराठाज Who among the following Indian rulers established embassies in foreign countries on modern lines? ये सारी चीजें हम लोग आगे आने वाले टाइम में कवर करेंगे बट जस्ट फॉर योर एडिफिकेशन इट वॉज टीपू सुल्तान ही एक्सचेंज एम्बेसीज विथ नॉट ओनली एशियन एंड अफ्रीकन पावर्स बट ऑल्सो विद यूरोपियन कंट्रीज फ्रांस तक उसने एम्बेसी अपना भेजा था यू ऑल्सो एक्सचेंज एम्बेसडर्स विद द रूलर्स ऑफ परजिया इजिप्ट अफगानिस्तान एंड बर्मा Which of the following statements does not apply to the subsidiary system of uh, so, sorry system of subsidiary lines introduced by Wellesley to maintain a large standing army at others' expense? Does this apply or not? Yes, to keep India safe from Napoleonic danger. Yes, this was one of the excuses used by Wellesley in order to introduce this policy. C to secure a fixed income for for the company. No provision ensured a fixed income for the company. So this is. Not one of those, right? And fourthly, to establish British paramount over Indian seas. This is correct. Correct answer is C over here. Which of the following pairs are correctly matched? List one and list two. List one may years or time periods be given. List two may wars. Told. Seventeen sixty nine, seventeen sixty seven, seven sixty nine. First Anglo Maratha war. Correct? Incorrect? Look. Here, na. One. छोटा सा टेबल बना लो प्रॉब्लम इट वुड बी इजियर फॉर यू टू रिमेंबर एंग्लो मैसोर वॉर्स हाउ मेनी फोर फर्स्ट फ्रॉम 1767 टू 69 विद क्लाइव 
नॉट एज गवर्नर जनरल इस समय तक गवर्नर जनरल नहीं होता था बट एज गवर्नर ऑफ बेंगाल सेकेंड एंग्लो माइसोर वॉर सेवेंटीन एट्टी टू एट्टी फोर विद वॉर इन हेस्टिंग्स एज गवर्नर जनरल ऑफ बेंगाल थर्ड सेवेंटीन नाइनटी से नाइनटी टू विद कॉनवॉलिस एज गवर्नर जनरल ऑफ बेंगाल एंड फोर्थ सेवेंटीन नाइनटी नाइन विद वेलेजली एज गवर्नर जनरल ऑफ बेंगाल ठीक है एंग्लो मराठा वॉर्स फर्स्ट सेवेंटीन सेवेंटी फाइव टू एट्टी टू हु वॉज गवर्नर जनरल वॉर एन हेस्टिंग्स सेकेंड एंग्लो मराठा वॉर एटीन जीरो टू जीरो फोर वेलेजली एंड थर्ड एटीन सेवेंटीन एटीन Who was Governor General? Lord Hastings. Anglo Nepal War. एक ही war हुआ कब 1814 फोर्टीन टू सिक्सटीन अंडर द गवर्नर जनरलशिप ऑफ लॉर्ड हेस्टिंग्स यहां तक का लिख लिया एंग्लो बर्मा वॉर्स हाउ मेनी वॉर्स तीन वॉर्स पहला वाला 1824 ट्वेंटी फोर टू ट्वेंटी सिक्स गवर्नर जनरल एमहर्स्ट सेकेंड 1852-53 गवर्नर जनरल डलहाउजी थर्ड 1885 एट्टी फाइव टू एट्टी सेवन गवर्नर जनरल डफरिन ठीक है एंग्लो सिख वॉर्स हाउ मेनी वॉर्स टू फर्स्ट 1845-46 गवर्नर जनरल हार्डिंज सेकेंड 1849 गवर्नर जनरल डलहाउजी देन एंग्लो अफगान वॉर्स How many wars? Three. First, eighteen thirty-nine to forty-two. Governor General, sorry, Auckland. Then, एटीन सेवेंटी एटीन सेवेंटी एट टू एट्टी है ना गवर्नर जनरल लिटिन थर्ड हाँ थर्ड नहीं था यहां पर ये करेक्ट देन वी हैव द एनेक्सेशन ऑफ सिंध When 1843 under uh, 
एलेन बरो ब्रॉट अबाउट बाय द ब्रिटिश लोकल एजेंट चार्ल्स नेपियर ठीक है ऑफ कोर्स देर आर मोर डिटेल्स टू बी रिमेंबर्ड ट्रीटीज कौन कौन सी हैं एक्सेट्रा बट दैट इज फॉर अ लेटर डेट अभी पहले इतना याद करने की कोशिश करो लिख लिया इतना कमिंग बैक टू दी क्वेश्चन अभी बताओ कौन कौन सा करेक्टली मैच है पहला वाला सही है गलत है गलत सेकेंड करेक्ट थर्ड सही है फोर्थ रॉन्ग राइट करेक्ट आंसर इज टू एंड थ्री ओनली डी द रूलर ऑफ विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्टेट वॉज रिमूव फ्रॉम पावर बाई द ब्रिटिश ऑन प्रीटेक्स ऑफ मिस गवर्नेंस अवध किसने हटाया था विच गवर्नर जनरल डल हाउजी वेन एटीन फिफ्टी सिक्स ठीक है नेक्स्ट सम प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन Who among the following was the first European to initiate the policy of subsidiary alliance in India? Had the list of options included Wellesley? So correct answer kya hota? Clive ya Wellesley? Wellesley. Since Wellesley is not there, uh, sorry, uh, Duple. ठीक है? So Duple ko. Question two. Consider the following statements and follow the instructions. A. Battle of Plassey can hardly be called a battle. Our outdated and weak military of the Nawab was no match for the modern and well-disciplined army of the English East India Company. Which of these options correctly captures the relationship between A and R? C, B, B will be wrong. Both are correct statements, hai, but R is not the correct explanation for A. Question three. Which of the following statements correctly describe the consequences of the Battle of Plassey? One, the English East India Company received the right to free trade in Bengal, Bihar, and Odisha. Two, British officials now had to pay taxes on their private trade. No. Three, British got an upper hand over the French in South India. Yes, सही है. So correct answer over here should be. थ्री ओनली नॉट इसमें कोई ऑप्शन है नहीं नन ऑफ दब नहीं है क्या अपर हैंड ओवर दी फ्रेंच इन साउथ इंडिया अरे बैटल ऑफ क्लासी के बाद ही तो बैटल ऑफ वॉन्डी वॉश थर्ड कर्नाटिक वॉर वगैरह होगा दिस स्टेटमेंट इज करेक्ट दी करेक्ट आंसर शुड बी थ्री ओनली प्लीज मेक दी अमेंडमेंट यहां पर गलती हो गई Next, with reference to the advent of British in 18th century India, Dutch were decisively defeated by the British in which battle? Bedara. C. Consider the following statements about dual system of administration in Bengal, which was established soon after the Battle of Buxar, 1764. Number one, under this system, British were practically responsible for diwani functions only. Correct or incorrect? Incorrect. they were practically responsible for nothing they were only theoretically responsible for diwani functions second divorce of power from responsibility was inherent in the system true administrative responsibility was divorced from financial power theek okay? hai so which of these statements is correct b two only In the context of Anglo-Mysore wars, arrange the following events in correct chronological order: Treaty of Seringapatnam, Death of Tipu Sultan, Treaty of Mangalore, Treaty of Madras. So, ये जब हम history of governor generals cover करेंगे, तब cover होगा ये under Wellesley. Right. In fact, remaining questions, I think कल का जो portion है वो cover कर लेंगे. Then you will be able to address. ठीक है? So Before I end this session, any suggestions from you guys? Is the pace okay? Are you being able to keep up with it? समझ में आ रहा है ना सब कुछ? चलिए 
कोई और अगर ऑल्ट्रेशन करने हैं सो प्लीज लेट मी नो सो दैट आई कैन मेक एडजस्टमेंट क्लियर है चलिए देन थैंक यू फॉर योर टाइम गाइज कल मिलते हैं एज फॉर दी सोर्सेज ना इसके अलावा आपको अभी कोई कुछ और पढ़ने की जरूरत नहीं है द क्लास नोट्स एंड हैंड आउट्स आर गोइंग टू बी मोर देन कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव सब कुछ कवर हो जाएगा हमारा ऑब्जेक्टिव ये नहीं है कि हंड्रेड आउट ऑफ हंड्रेड करेक्ट करने हैं एट्टी आउट ऑफ हंड्रेड करने हैं वो इतने में हो जाएगा इतना गारंटी है ठीक है चलिए थैंक यू